Jędrzej, możemy zaczynać. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone at the keynote lectures of the 59th Polish and 17th International Students Medical Conference, Juvenes Pro Medicina, 2021. Due to the ongoing epidemiological situation, we decided to organize our conference online. My name is Olivia Kwaśniewska, and I have the pleasure to lead today's meeting. Firstly, we would like to thank our Here are the conditions for participation. Share a photo showing how you participate in keynote lectures Juvenis Pro Medicina 2021. Like our post, like our post on Facebook, follow the Instagram of the Student Scientific Society of Medical University of Łódź. In the competition, we will select four winners who will receive prizes funded by our sponsors. Many Mornings, Silveco, Pharmaceries, and Adra Urban and Partner. Now it's finally time to start the keynote lectures. Please take a short look. Here you can see a schedule of today's meeting. We begin 59th Polish and 17th International Students Medical Conference Juvenis Pro Medicina 2021 keynote lectures with Professor Agnieszka Hacińska's lecture, Cellular Stress Management, the case of mitochondria. Dear Professor, please turn on your camera and confirm that you are ready to start the lecture. Please share your screen now using the share screen button on the bottom of the application. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, confer I'm confirmed that I'm ready and I will share as my screen in just a second. I hope you can see already. Is this okay with my presentation? Do you see my title screen? Okay, so uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this keynote lecture. This is really a great honor for me. And I also appreciate very much absolutely great organization and the contact with the uh, organizing committee, especially uh, Olivia. Indeed, I'd like to talk today about uh, some basic science um, uh, and the title is, uh, um, the title is about cellular stress management, and I hope to convince you that my um, the, uh, and ho hope to convince you that the case of mitochondria is indeed interesting in in this context. I would like to also note that uh, me as a scientist, I'm a not a not medical doctor. P I'm a PhD, and I'm a completely quite completely basic scientist who is interested in cellular biochemistry protein transport within the cell, organelles, especially mitochondria, mechanisms and physiological implications of, of uh, working of these organelles and, and, and proteins that build these organelles, as well as cellular stress responses and uh, its implica their implications for aging. And I'd like to very briefly to introduce you a little bit, a few words about myself about my, um, my career. So I did uh, uh, my PhD in the Institute of Biochemistry and Biophysics in Warsaw. Then I've been interested in several, during different stages of my careers, I was interested in, in several topics, but all fall into uh, broadly understood molecular cell biology and organellar biology and proteins. Uh, so, as you can see, different stages in my career, my scientific interest evolved. 
from mechanisms uh, to uh, more now physiological consequences and uh, and, and pathology actually. I also have changed, I was really also quite mobile. I have changed my working places several times. And currently I am at the University of Warsaw and starting a new Institute of the Polish Academy of Science. I would also like you to note if what, what I actually highlighted here on the bottom of the slide is that um, a few papers that are the milestone of each stage uh, milestones for me of the of of, of uh, uh, as a as a, uh, in my in my uh, stages of my scientific career and these are not all the papers that that we have produced me and my uh, collaborators and co-workers but those are the papers that I view as the most important ones in developing my scientific interests. And I was wondering uh, what, how I should I should lead this lecture to you, and how I should actually um, what I should focus about, and what uh, and then I decided that I'd like to present basic science as a something which is a very complementary to medical research. And nowadays the borders are not that clear anymore. The case of COVID and vaccination, RNA-based vaccination is maybe the best recent example of that. And what I will tell you soon is the use of model organisms that biologists use uh, to actually maybe we, of course, produce very basic knowledge that is necessary later on to understand pathologies and to find the good therapies for, for human diseases. But maybe the most important uh, the most important highlight that I would like to, to, to give it to you at the very beginning, and I will try to refer to that during my, my talk, is that um, these basic scientists are really good to, uh, to, uh, to try to distinguish between correlation and cause. And the picture actually, actually I have stolen from the, from the Facebook of one of my uh, research colleagues. You see this kitty, and I think you can think that either, either this kitty just chose this, this destroyed part of the road or his action caused the destruction of the road. If you think about that all the, during my, um, my talk and later on, once you will be having your own professional life with patients and with medical research, I think this is a, a very good uh, example to still keep in mind and try to understand that and try to see the differences between correlations and causes. So let me start my lectures by my lecture uh, by introducing mitochondria as powerhouses of the cell. So we probably all remember from biochemistry lessons that these organelles are responsible for generation of energy, but also many, many metabolic pathways happen, happened in these organelles. They also are survived, the stage is, sur is surveilled by the cell because, uh, because the cell needs to know the state of, of these organelles as a main provider of energy. Therefore, they are also more and more recognized as signaling hub. And uh, they have complicated structure and I will not go into this uh, very much. I'd like only that we all uh, remember that mitochondria are involved in very, very many diseases. These are, I will start from this very um, common uh, neurodegenerative diseases and where the cause where the role of mitochondria, whether this is a cause or actually um, a, a correlation is not entirely clear, but whenever you have neurodegenerative uh, diseases, you always have problems with mitochondria. Then there are also metabolic diseases, also growing group of, of large diseases where mitochondria and their role in metabolism is becoming very, uh, is becoming absolutely appreciated. And finally, also at the end of my talk, I'd like to mention about very rare genetically inherited mitochondrial diseases and a few words uh, I will spend on these diseases and the results we have uh, we have in this area. So now I'd like to introduce to you mitochondria from other perspective, other sci our scientific interest li lies in proteins and how they are uh, formed. 
how they are transported into the correct location in the cell. And in our case, this, the correct location is in mitochondria and within mitochondria, within these complicated structures of mitochondria. And of course, again, we we probably all now remember that mitochondria have the have the, these organelles have their own genome, and this genome call encodes for a few really important proteins. But these are only a few proteins; just one percent of the entire set of mitochondria prote proteins called mitochondria proteome. Whenever I say proteome, I mean the entire set of of proteins that um, populate space like, like this one that uh, we call mitochondria. And 99% of mitochondria proteins are actually encoded by nucleus, so they are, in, they are synthesized on the cytosolic ribosomes, have to, have to be imported. And for a long time, people were interested in the mechanisms of protein translocation across mitochondrial membranes so that the proteins reach location, proper location within these membranes and soluble submitochondrial compartments, but also uh, build the really big multimeric complexes, which are very typical feature of these organelles. However, uh, not very many people, this many years ago, uh, when we started this, this research, were interested in the in the fate of proteins just after their synthesis on the cytosolic ribosomes and before they enter to uh, uh, and they enter mitochondria. And we asked the question, some time ago, we asked the question, what, what's happening with the cell actually when the protein transport um, is, uh, is disrupted or slowed down, which one can imagine very easily in all pathological conditions I actually mentioned already at the beginning. But even under some developmental physiological conditions, uh, such situations could actually happen. So what, how, the how the cell reacts for that? You, have the, you now have a really large bulk of proteins that are not imported so quickly. They stay in the cytosol and they cannot really mature in the correct way how they would mature being inside of mitochondria. And sometimes, some time ago, several years ago, we actually found that, that the ubiquitin proteases proteasome system regulates the import of mitochondrial proteins. So regulates these proteins where they are on the way into mitochondria. And the ubiquitin proteasome system is a major degradation system for proteins, but not in mitochondria, but rather outside in the cytosol. And this is actually showed here on that summary slide. We found that in the case mitochondrial protein mm, precursor proteins, so these are, we call it precursors when the protein is not fully yet imported into mitochondria. So all these proteins are synthesized and they have two now two ways. They can either go smoothly to mitochondria and be then removed from the cytosol. But in the case mitochondrial protein import slows down, these proteins do not stay in the cytosol, but are removed by, by, this, by this machinery to degrade prote pro proteins, the cellular proteins called the proteasome, uh, which is a very multimeric complex, exactly like, like on this slide. And we also found that we have an interesting stress response connected with this dysfunction of mitochondria. And again, remember, dysfunction of mitochondria happens in many, many diseases that I actually, I told you at the very beginning. So we have unfolded protein response. Uh, coming, the stress is coming from these proteins that have been synthesized, but not fully imp imported into mitochondria. In, sometimes we call this response as an APRAM. Okay, and how we found it, I think I, I only will say we will not go into much detail of these experiments, but just the examples how some of our experiments look like. We look at many proteins with, using Western broads, proteomics, we also look at the cells and we will, you will see the examples of this type of research within from my talk. And I'd like to also stress I, I, I told you about model organisms. We use several of them in the laboratory, in the laboratory starting from a very simple model, such as yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It's a very sim simple unicellular eukaryotic cell. 
uh, unicellular organism that is eukaryote, meaning it has all the organelles, including mitochondria, of course. And in fact, this, this organism also is very famous for, for research, for decades of research on mitochondria. So we found this APRAM, this, uh, this stress response connected with dysfunction of mitochondria, especially protein import, which leads to the increase of the, of the proteasome, of the capacity to degrade proteasome by the, uh, by the activation of the proteasome. We found it in yeast by looking at the proteins and the ubiquitinated species and their levels uh, on uh, open mitochondrial dysfunction and um, and when we, uh, which is now highlighted in red as one of the mitochondrial import mutants. But anyway, let's don't go too deta in a too detailed way into these results. The, the main uh, main thing what I want to uh, want want to uh, to bring to you here is the use of model organism, even as simple as yeast, and the use of, of the mutants that are very helpful to actually differentiate between correlations and the causes in biological or systems, which we all deal, and you, you uh, being interested in, in medicine, you will definitely deal with, with them, you are dealing with now and will be dealing in the future. So now example again of, of such, such, um, such experiment with overexpression of proteins again in the model system that leads to the activation of the proteasome. So these are the evidence that build actually the, uh, the, our, our story on the APRAM that I started this part of my lecture here. We also noticed an interesting, actually interesting, um, we made an interesting observation at the time that when we activate the proteasome via uh, this mitochondrial dysfunction or via mitochondrial proteins, we actually, so activating the proteasome that is machinery to degrade, that is a machinery to degrade proteins, proteins in the cell was actually beneficial for the cells. And this is, also in line with research that has been done in the world and, and published in many papers. Our unique angle to that was that this was actually uh, on the basis of this was a basis of this was a very mild mitochondrial dysfunction that led to some benefic the beneficial effect. And this is of course very strange if you remember biochemistry books and if you remember what I told you, how important role this mitochondria play in the cell. But the important role is of course very important, but still if you have a bit of mild stress, it turns out that this mild stress activates stress responses like this activation of the proteasome and the stress responses in turn may bring some benefit later or for different uh, conditions. Still, the work presented here was done, uh, was done in yeast, but we've been wondering whether such a stress response for mitochondria to, to, to dysfunction mitochondria protein import machinery is a universal mechanism. And for, is a universal mechanism. And for that, we used another model organism, now much more complex and already multicellular. Uh, worm, which is called Senorabditis elegans, also very famous in biological and biomedical research uh, for several, for several, in several fields of this research, especially, I would say, developmental biology, work on apoptosis, so programmed cell death, but also aging. And we found that if we uh, now uh, reduce protein import into mitochondria, we also activate the proteasome. And we found that this activation of the proteasome is a cause of the life prolongation. So we have an interesting case that we have a dysfunction of mitochondria. This dysfunction in mitochond of mitochondria is mild, so mild that it doesn't have a very negative effect on, on on organisms, but in fact, activates a stress response that includes also activation of the proteasome, and this stress response leads to life prolongation. So that's uh, something which is quite interesting because if we now start to think about that, we as biologists, 
uh, we more go into deeper mechanisms. Try we are now trying to figure out how this really works. But from biomedical or medical point of view, this is also very interesting. Of course, nobody. If we think about a healthy uh, life and prolongation of healthy life, I think nobody will seriously think about about making mitochondria dysfunctional because this is not the way to do this. But if we will learn more about the mechanisms, what's happening actually here, we can uh, think about uh, active molecules, drugs that could activate such a beneficial stress response without having this, this mitochondrial dysfunction um, contribution. So now again, we are in this picture and again, example how we can uh, understand more what's happening in human diseases. And our collaborators from the chemistry department at the University of Cambridge has made an interesting some so for, for many years, they use a lot of calculation and bio, bioinformatic tools that uh, that I, I do not fully understand, but nevertheless, they make, made very interesting correlations and suggested very interesting hypotheses. So they found that proteins that they call metastable or supersaturated, or other words, these are the proteins that easily aggregate in the cell, that these proteins are actually downregulated in the brains of Alzheimer patients. And they hypothesized that the, these proteins may be aggregate. And at this stage, they turned to us more people who do experiments. And we started to work together on, on this topic. We again moved to East to check whether the proteins that that are that, that actually are homologous to, to those who, ab, who aggregate in the brains of Alzheimer patients, whether these proteins um, uh, whether these proteins actually really aggregate in the cell, because what our collaborators from the lab of Michele Vendruscolo have shown, this was not the experiments, these were just hypotheses and calculations. For that, we also needed to show that. And indeed, we showed that this is the case. We also showed a very interesting effect because these my non imported mitochondrial precursor proteins in the cytosol have been aggregating but this was not neutral for the cell. Actually, many other proteins started to aggregate. And this experiment, for example, shows you alpha synuclein, so the protein model for uh, aggregation that is connected to uh, Parkinson's disease in this case. And as you could see uh, from, this, from these experiments, um, the moment the, the situation when you have a dysfunctional protein import or dysfunctional mitochondria leads to, uh, to uh, faster aggregation of synuclein. Interestingly, when we take other models for neurodegenerative diseases, this is beta amyloid in the case of, of Alzheimer, we also see much bigger aggregation of, of, of those neurodegeneration related proteins when we have mitochondrial dysfunction. So we would like to call this, this effect, this is we still the paper is now on the last stage of revisions, we would like to call this effect snowball effect. And it's the cause of this effect is dysfunction of mitochondria, but this dysfunction of mitochondria leads that the that the that the protein uh, that the import of proteins into mitochondria is not uh, efficient. So those proteins start now. They, some of them, they will be degraded by the proteasome, but some, some of them will start to aggregate. And this aggregation is just not like forming deposits neutral for the cell, but this aggregation actually accelerates aggregation of proteins in the cell, causing really big troubles in, in maintaining very important feature of the cell, which is, which is a protein, uh, protein, which is protein homeostasis, cellular protein homeostasis. And in fact, these, these results are quite uh, interesting also from another perspective. When we look at the molecular basis of neurodegeneration in case of Alzheimer, Parkinson, and many other types of degeneration that actually uh, connects, um, that are happening in neurons or affect cognitive functions of, of humans, you always see these um, two 
completely and from the first glance completely unrelated um, mechanisms. One mechanism is the is exactly aggregation of proteins and the kind of a collapse of protein homeostasis. And the other mechanism, the other uh, process was, that is happening during uh, the, the neurodegeneration is dysfunction of mitochondria with all the consequences of this dysfunction. And these processes have never been, have, has, ha, have not been connected in a causative way together. And our study from these simple organisms using yeast or C. elegans, also human cells, shows that actually there is a very interesting link that is the snowball effect. So it's one process accelerates another one. Okay, now I'd like to summarize this part of my, uh, of my uh, lecture and uh, would like to move to the last part of my lecture where I would, and the summary of the previous part is, is very simple. simple. We have a mitochond we, if we have mitochondrial dysfunction, that is a common feature of many pathologies. We also have very frequently protein import dysfunction and this causes some consequences for the cell. One is a beneficial consequence. This is activation of the clearance machinery, which is called the proteasome. Another one is not so uh, beneficial, it's aggregation. And this aggregation causes, uh, may, it may have a potential to actually accelerate a collapse of mitochondria protein, of the cellular protein homeostasis in, uh, in under, under pathological conditions. Now, mitochondrial functions. So I've been speaking a lot of, about mitochondria, but actually I've been mostly speaking about the events that are happening outside of mitochondria, exactly under a situation where the protein import is inhibited. But now I'd like to focus actually on mitochondrial function. And as I mentioned to you, there are several diseases, very rare, much rarer than those uh, that, that neurodegenerative diseases and um, genetic diseases which are con called mitochondrial diseases and they are caused by the, uh, by, by the mutations in genes coding for mitochondrial proteins and usually involved in oxidative phosphorylation. And they, they affect, they, they again affect, uh, affect mostly, so the, the, the patients, they, 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 they are affected mostly in several, several areas. These are usually tissues that are very much dependent on mitochondria, uh, such as brain or muscles where this uh, energy demand is very high. And we ask very simple question in this uh, an area. So if we have mitochondrial dysfunction due to genetic disorder, can we improve mitochondrial state by improving protein import? And again, when you look at this picture that with the story that we published using yeast as a model system, we, we, you, you will clearly see one uh, consequence of that, that you can improve protein import, the efficiency of protein import into mitochondria by actually inhibiting the proteasome, because now that these precursor proteins will not have two ways to go, to disappear from the cytosol, either be degraded or be uptaken by mitochondria, but the one of the ways will be, will be closed, so they can only be uptaken by mitochondria. And this was based on, on this kind of thinking, and I will show you one result in a moment that, that, that proves that in some cases, uh, the ones that th these cases where we tested this can be, this actually thinking is correct. So when we have healthy mitochondria, of course, proteins are nicely imported inside mitochondria and they work there and everything what's connected with the mitochondria thing function is, is, is going very well, including oxidative phosphorylation. However, when we have pathology, due to different reasons, also like in mitochondrial diseases, we have the proteins are not imported because they have mutations. This causes other proteins not to be imported and so on and so on. We have these proteins accumulating outside of mitochondria and they are degraded by the, by the proteasome. They are gone. They have no, no second chance to enter mitochondria. In case when we actually inhibit the proteasome, we prolong their the, 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 the time they spend 
outside of mitochondria, they have another chance and yet another chance to enter mitochondria and therefore we could overcome the, the mitochondrial dysfunction that way, providing more proteins, even though they will be a little bit not so healthy, but they there will be more of these proteins through, through inhibition of the proteasome. And that was indeed the case. And here is the example of one genetic disorder. We have modeled this in normal hex cells, but we also have, did, uh, have done the experiments in patient fibroblast and could show that using um, the proteasome inhibitors that are now actually clinically uh, approved for cancer, we can also improve the cellular well-being and mitochondrial well-being in these disease cells coming from the patients. And this, of course, raises the question, raises the issue of uh, that mitochondrial diseases, we have no cure for these diseases. They, they are very severe. And our research, we are now proceeding further with that, going into more complex systems. But our research clearly shows at this point that the proteasome inhibitors, the ones that you can, that, that they are used in some of the cancer research could be actually also used as a potential new, or at least um, analyzed as a, as a new strategy to improve health of mitochondrial disease patients. And with that, I would like to finish my talk. And uh, I'd like to thank very much the collaborators from different countries. So I have presented several stories that are either published or are now in the last stage of, of publishing. And uh, the story about aggregates is, was, um, was done in collaboration with, with Michele Vendruscoro and Chris Dobson from University of Cambridge. And, um, and the, the uh, uh, proteasome inhibitors were done in collaboration with uh, Massimo Zeviani and his team at, the, at that stage, also in Cambridge now, currently in Padova. And I would like to thank, of course, my, uh, my group, my lab, and several important names you have, I have mentioned already during the talk. And uh, let me also tell you that we are moving from the University of Warsaw to the newly established institute, which is called IMOL, and this is the Institute of the Polish Academy of Science. And we have lots of possibilities. We are recruiting people and we have lots of possibilities of doing research also for those who have more medical oriented um, interest in general, but would like to know how basic research is going on. And uh, because as I strongly believe and many, um, and not, not only me, but this is a general tendency that these borders between biology and, and medicine are, are slowly uh, basically disappearing. And even, you know, everyone now is, is using a common term, term biomedical research. And with that, uh, advertising this new, uh, new institution and uh, our research, um, I'd like to finish and thank you very much for your um, uh, attention and uh, I'm, I will be happy to take questions. Okay, so thank you, Professor Agnieszka Hacińska, for your excellent presentation. Dear participants, do you have any questions for the lecturer? If yes, please write them down in the live chat. I'm checking if any questions are appearing, but I can see that now we don't have any. So I guess that it's high time for the next keynote speaker to start uh, his presentation. Thank you again, Professor you Agnieszka much. Hacińska for your time and really great lecture. Uh, so, without further ado, our next keynote speaker is Professor Jacek Jasem. The title of his lecture is My Vision for Cancer Treatment. Unfortunately, the professor may not be with us today, 
but he has prepared a recording of his lecture for you. Let's listen carefully. Thank you for inviting me to your conference. It's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I will present you my vision of cancer treatment in the future. First, uh, you have to know that cancer is the second cause of mortality worldwide after heart and uh, circulatory, disease, uh, circulatory diseases. More than one out of every three people will develop cancer in their lifetime. And currently we have um, 7.6 million deaths from cancer per year. I will then address uh, major can cancer therapies uh, and will tell you what we have today and what I expect we will have in the future. So surgery uh, is most frequently used therapy for cancer, but it has also changed uh, considerably within the past decades. This is late uh, Professor Umberto Veronesi from Milan, uh, who was a friend of mine, who developed a new paradigm in cancer treatment, surgical cancer treatment, saying that we have to go from maximum tolerated to minimal effective surgery. In the past, surgery was mutilating, was very extensive, and currently we can cure many malignancies with less aggressive therapies. This is an example. These are two patients uh, with the same disease, which is breast cancer, one treated in the 70s of 20th century and another treated in the 21st century. As you see, uh, all patients uh, in 20th century uh, up to uh, around 80s were treated with mastectomy. And of course, uh, these patients were mutilated, had many problems, uh, psychological, physical, and others. Whereas we can do the same with a small incision, removal of the tumor, and irradiating the entire breast, and you see that not only the patient is cured, but also the aesthetic effect is um, very uh, satisfied, satisfactory. What we use now in surgery is laparoscopic surgery, which uh, largely replaced traditional open surgery. And so uh, we have many applications of this uh, I would say small, uh, less aggressive surgery in both within the abdomen, within the pelvis and within the chest. This is uh, one. One of the examples, uh, we can also perform surgery through natural body orifices where we don't cut the skin. Uh, so we can insert the instrument, for example, to the alimentary tract. We can do surgery within, uh, within uh, various organs located in the abdomen. So there is absolutely no incision. Everything is done uh, with natural uh, orifices. This is uh, robotic surgery, which is also becoming more and more popular. And you see that the surgeon is sitting uh, a few meters from the patient during the surgery and operating with sticks uh, and not with his hands. And this is an artificial hand which has 10 uh, fingers instead of five of the human. Here are instruments inserted and the surgeon uh, performs the operation from the distance. Many surgeons uh, argue that it is more precise and uh, more uh, effective and provides less uh, complications. However, um, others uh, uh, say that it is still controversial. 
If we can perform a surgery from a distance of a few meters, perhaps we can also do it from a um, uh, larger distance, even hundreds or thousands of kilometer, kilometers from the operating theater. And this is telesurgery. Uh, indeed, uh, it is already possible and maybe it will be practiced more largely in the future. Uh, part, particularly for surgeries which are very specialized and uh, the center has no specialist at home. Mm, so, uh, of course, there should be an operating theater, there should be a local team uh, taking care of the patient, but the most important part of the surgery might be performed remotely. If we can do the robotic surgery, we can also consider robots uh, performing surgery in the future, whereas uh, human possibilities are limited. Uh, technical developments may uh, once uh, allow constructing a robot, which will be much more efficient than the human. I'm a radiation oncologist and uh, I am a medical oncologist. So a few words about uh, radiotherapy. The trends, recent trends in radiotherapy include improvements in imaging. Radiotherapy is based on imaging. So it's not only traditional imaging, but also biological, molecular, and functional imaging. Uh, there are uh, several improvements in treatment delivery, such as real-time tracking of new moving tumors. Uh, as you know, uh, some tumors uh, within the body, for example, uh, localized in the chest or uh, in the abdomen uh, due to physiological movements of, of the organs move uh, during treatment, and we have to take it into consideration. And also adaptive radiotherapy, which takes into consideration uh, the real size of the tumor at the time of radiotherapy delivery. The radiotherapy takes uh, uh, usually a few weeks, and within this time, uh, the tumor may shrink, for example, so we can adapt radiotherapy to the current situation. Then uh, we use personalized treatment. Uh, where we tailor treatment and doses according to specific tumor biology, cell density areas of, hypo uh, of hypoxia or rapid growth, cell metabolism within the tumor, etc. And finally, uh, we mm, very frequently combine now uh, radiotherapy with novel systemic therapies, which uh, largely increase uh, increases. Uh, it, uh, radiotherapy efficacy. This is a very interesting new development. It is a hybrid of MRI and uh, linear accelerator, uh, where we can visualize a uh, body during therapy. As you know, MRI is not using uh, ionizing radiation, so it is possible. And we, so we place uh, the patient uh, here on the bed, here is both uh, linear accelerator and, uh, and magnetic resonance. Uh, this is an example how we could use it. This is uh, axilla with involved lymph nodes. Of course, we have to irradiate entire axilla, axilla but we can visualize uh, enlarged lymph nodes, probably involved by cancer, and we can um, uh, during the during in real time, we can deliver higher dose using uh, resonance magnetic resonance, which will show you this area. So this is very a very precise radiotherapy, and this uh, allows um, decreasing the risk of complications such as arm and edema. Radiotherapy uh, may be used instead of surgery, and for example. In early lung cancer, everybody would say surgery is a treatment of choice. Indeed, if you have a small tumor, I would say the vast majority of patients is treated with uh, surgery. However, there were three clinical trials comparing uh, surgery to um, uh, stereotactic radiotherapy, which is a very specific form of radiotherapy where we use uh, narrow beams uh, from various uh, 
planes and uh, from various directions it allows uh, a very using a very high dose locally and you see the effect and surprisingly uh, stereotactic radiotherapy proved to be more effective than such Radiation can also uh, induce some uh, uh, systemic effect. This is so-called abscopal effect, namely uh, radiotherapy by damaging tumor uh, and uh, uh, cancer cell death uh, allows uh, releasing uh, some tumor antigens, making them more susceptible to immunotherapy and also the, the activity of the human uh, immune system and indeed uh, combining uh, radiotherapy with immune therapy is one of the uh, new uh, developments and uh, raises many hopes. This is an example of this abscopal effect. Abscopal effect is the effect outside of the irradiated field. Uh, this was a paper published a few years ago in Lancet Oncology where patients with uh, multiple metastases were irradiated and given granulocyte macrophage colonial stimulating factor. And you see uh, that in many instances, uh, tumors outside the irradiated field shrinked, uh, regressed, uh, some of them uh, completely regressed. Uh, and this is uh, a good illustration of this phenomenon. Of course, uh, the largest uh, developments we see with uh, systemic therapies, and I will give you uh, some uh, information on that, but I will start with milestones in molecular oncology, which allowed uh, rapid development of new uh, systemic therapies. So there were three milestones in molecular oncology. One was in 53, where uh, Watson and Crick discovered uh, DNA structure and, and, fact, and function. The second uh, milestone was identifying and mapping all of the genes of the human genome. So the human genome project uh, run by two independent groups allowed uh, the discovery of the of the genes uh, every human has uh, there are several dozens thousands of genes and we know their function now and this the, the, the this the the utility of this enterprise was questioned but without this we couldn't do anything in terms of new uh, targeted, uh, molecularly targeted therapies. And the third milestone is uh, initiating in 2006 Cancer Genome Atlas. If you can imagine, we have something like 40,000 genes, and each gene may have uh, thousands of mutations, so it's innumerable number of combinations and each uh, malignancy has completely different molecular portrait and we are discovering one by one these molecular features of particular malignancies and of course uh, this allows uh, oncology to be more and more precise so uh, the uh, human genome has been uh, unraveled and of course God says uh, we have to change the password, but I am afraid it's too late. And so uh, this uh, resulted in a large uh, change in uh, paradigms of cancer treatment, and we have completely different therapies now than a few decades ago. So first we have targeted therapies. What are targeted therapies? These are therapies that block the growth of cancer cells by interfering with specific target molecules needed for carcinogenesis and tumor growth. So it's a kind of Achilles heel of, uh, of the cancer, a weak point of the cancer where we can specifically uh, hit it uh, to destroy cancer cells 
and uh, spare uh, normal cells, which was not possible with traditional uh, chemotherapy, which killed all dividing cells, also uh, normal cells like like gonads or epithelial cells or uh, uh, cells produ producing uh, blood. So this is the first uh, drug, targeted drug, uh, which uh, appeared in the beginning of 21st century. It was uh, imatinib. And this is the tumor we were, we, we, um, were not aware of uh, before imatinib was developed, or very few uh, physicians were, ever, were aware of this tumor because the tumor is very rare. This gastrointestinal stroma tumor, it was placed among just uh, other uh, gastrointestinal non epithelial tumors. But this tumor had specific molecular features, uh, uh, a mutation that might be uh, a target for molecular targeted therapies. And indeed, a new compound was developed uh, exactly uh, hitting this uh, weak point of the tumor. And you see, even if you are not a specialist, you see, you see a huge tumor in the abdomen, which is highly resistant to any therapies which can be removed by surgery, which is uh, radio resistant and chemo resistant. And we couldn't do in the past anything with such a situation. And you see that after a couple of months, you see a huge regression of the tumor with this specific uh, therapy. Interestingly, the same molecular uh, abnormality is also seen in chronic myeloid leukemia, completely different malignancy. And you see the progress in treatment of this uh, malignancy. You see that uh, in the past, in, uh, in 70s of the last surgery, the tumor was, the malignancy was completely um, incurable. Most of the patient died uh, within uh, a couple of years. And you see here the progress mainly uh, due to development of tumor therapy. And here are current results with an imatinib. This was the first uh, molecular targeted uh, therapy uh, used in this malignancy. Now we have more. So it converted uh, this malignancy into really chronic disease. So people could live uh, years with this disease and not necessarily died of this disease. So this uh, therapy was claimed uh, uh, new uh, uh, bullets uh, uh, in cancer treatment. And indeed, it was indeed uh, absolutely uh, new, uh, big development in cancer treatment, which changed. Uh, therapy considered. So uh, another targeted therapy, which is very commonly used be because it uh, is used in uh, a common malignancy, is trastuzumab. It is a monoclonal antibody used in the treatment of so-called HER2 positive breast cancer. And you see here that the combination of trastuzumab and chemotherapy uh, administered after the surgery in this subpopulation of patients is much more efficient than uh, chemotherapy alone. Uh, if we have uh, new therapies, then we look for uh, uh, its targets. And such targets, for example, in, in non sponsor lung cancer are numerous. And once we had uh, a division uh, into three large groups, of non-sponsored lung cancer, including adenocarcinoma, large cell carcinoma, and squamous cell carcinoma. Now uh, we see that uh, lung cancer is a heterogeneous disease. There are several uh, subtypes of this tumor. So it is becoming a conglomerate of rare diseases rather than one big disease. And for each of these subsets, we will have particular, specific, precise therapies. 
This is an example of the use of targeted therapies in uh, non-sponsored lung cancer. This is our first patient treated with ALK inhibi uh, inhibitor, ALK. Uh, abnormalities are seen in 4 to 7% of uh, adeno adenocarcinoma patients. It's a rare uh, abnormality, and you see here a patient, 44 year uh, old lady, which was already after three lines of chemotherapy, and she was absolutely incurable with expected survival of a couple of weeks. And after administering these new therapies, which was uh, at that time in clinical trial at my department, you see dramatic response, uh, and the patient went to the swimming pool with her daughter and survived another three and a half years. So this is the comparison of crizotinib versus chemotherapy. And you see that in this particular subset of patients, crizotinib is much more effective than chemotherapy. And here you see the effect of second generation ALK inhibitor, which is much more effective than crizotinib. And again, these patients live with their cancer and not necessarily uh, die of uh, this malignant. And currently, we have a large array of uh, targeted therapies that can be used. And of course, uh, there are large perspectives for, for these therapies, because uh, currently we have established uh, kinase inhibitors that cover only 15% of the entire genome. So there is a big potential for new targets, and uh, the selectivity of these therapies are increasing. So we can better uh, define genetically uh, the subsets of patients. Uh, new technologies uh, such as genome-wide screening allows discovery of new therapies and uh, also high throughput molecular technologies allow for more comprehensive identification of molecular targets. Another very uh, interesting uh, development in oncology is uh, unblocking immune system. I have to explain you how, uh, uh, how it works. Uh, so the main um, effector cells fighting with cancer in physiological conditions and uh, of course uh, in, in the development of malignancy are cytotoxic T cells. Uh, in our body, we have billions of uh, cell divisions uh, every while. And of course, if you have that many divisions, some divisions are uh, effective, uh, are, uh, uh, ineffective, uh, um, leading to uh, some mutations. And if you have mutations in the cell, it's uh, a short way uh, to um, uh, making the cells malignant. In, in everybody, in, in the body of each of us, uh, several times in, in, in our life, some malignant cell, cells are present, and it's uh, effective immune system that kills the cells before they develop a tumor. Of course, in some situations, this uh, immune defense is ineffective, and the cancer finally develops, but generally uh, uh, our defense system is very effective. In some situations, as I said, uh, this uh, tumor may escape uh, this, the immune system, and uh, the role of immune therapy is enhance the power of our immune system. And immunotherapy is now uh, used in several uh, situations uh, in many malignancies. Uh, so uh, it is very likely that it will once largely replace uh, current systemic therapies, namely chemotherapy, because it's much more precise and uh, less toxic. To give you again an example, this is the efficacy of chemotherapy in advanced non small cell lung cancer versus uh, immunotherapy agent, which is pembrolizumab. Uh, uh, and you see huge difference. Uh, these patients uh, live much longer and have less uh, toxicity. 
This is another application of uh, immune therapy in uh, advanced melanoma. Advanced melanoma with chemotherapy was uh, totally incurable disease and most patients died within uh, the first year of the diagnosis. Whereas uh, nivolumab, which is uh, a immune therapy agent used in this malignancy allows for much longer survival. And this, we, we can keep this patient uh, alive for years now. And immune therapy has uh, big uh, prospects because out of 30 ligands and receptors involved in the immune response, we can now uh, use in the clinics only two, which are CTLA-4 and uh, PD-1, PDL-1 axis. So these are so-called checkpoints inhibitors. As, as I mentioned, we unblock uh, the immune system, empower it, and it is effectively, uh, effectively fighting cancer. We can expect a complementary effect of combining uh, various checkpoint inhibitors, and we already use it, for example, in treating melanoma, where CTL, the, a combination of CTLA-4 and PD-1 uh, inhibitor uh, provides much more effect than any of those used alone. Then we can uh, consider combinations of immune therapy with targeted therapies. Also with standard chemotherapy, we already combined chemotherapy and immune therapy in advanced uh, non-sponsored cancer with very good effect. And finally, with radiation, as I mentioned, enhancing the immune, uh, immune system uh, when the antigen is uh, uncovered with radiotherapy gives a very uh, attractive perspective. We can also consider cancer vaccines, which are not yet used in oncology uh, or used very scarcely, but in the, in the future, cancer vaccines may also be exploited as one of the possibilities uh, to fight cancer. And finally, what we already had is CAR, uh, chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy, which uh, includes removing uh, T-cells from the body by leukapharesis, ex vivo uh, genetic modification of these cells and multiplying them and returning to the body. So we have, uh, I would say, armed T cell T cells multiplied uh, ex vivo and infused uh, again to the body uh, to fight uh, malignancies. And whereas mm, uh, malignancies with many mutations, many somatic mutations such as melanoma, uh, lung cancer, or blood bladder cancer, and others are uh, on this uh, side of the scale, this is the number of somatic mutations, they are very immunogenic and they are treated with monoclonal antibodies. So uh, already presented here, uh, which are uh, checkpoint inhibitors. There are some malignancies which are much less immunogenic. So they have just one mutation, a leading mutation, and these are mainly uh, hematologic malignancies, but also some uh, solid tumors. These uh, malignancies are the subject of CAR T cell therapy, which will uh, hopefully convert these malignancies into at least chronic disease, if not curable diseases. So this is uh, this is a, a graph showing the uh, development of immune therapy. So this was this is the first immunotherapeutic agent, CTLA-4 inhibitor, which allowed a prolongation of survival, namely in melanoma. This is the sec second generation uh, compounds uh, blocking pd one pathway. This is a combination of both, as I mentioned in melanoma, 
that this combination proved to be much more effective than either alone. And here we can imagine that by uh, combination and sequencing not only immune therapies, but also combination with targeted therapies, chemotherapy and other anti-cancer therapies, we may convert a cancer into chronic disease. And you see a huge difference between the first generation immune therapy and potentially what we can achieve uh, within the uh, next few years or decades. Uh, to give you an example of the huge uh, progress in the treatment of cancer, you have here survival rates in children and young adults. And you see that many malignancies, you see uh, these malignancies these are typical malignancies of childhood, which were totally incurable in the, in the past. Uh, this is the uh, cure rate yeah, are now uh, treated highly effectively and the treatment results among children are currently much better than in adults. And we do hope we will have the same progress also in adult uh, malignancies. So, peraspera ad astra, the Latin proverb. This is what we had in the past. We were blind. Uh, we were not specific in our therapies. Uh, what we have now uh, is a much more precise oncology, uh, hitting particular uh, uh, features of the tumor, not present or le much less important in normal cells. And with this, uh, we hope we will have much more successes than we had in the past. I thank you for your attention. Okay, so uh, due to the fact that Professor Yasaki Assem isn't here with us today, the discussion is not possible. So I believe that it's high time uh, to proceed to our next keynote speaker. Uh, it is Professor Adam Dzicki. Do we need mentor in medicine? How to choose the right mentor? These are the questions you will answer by listening carefully to the lecture. Dear Professor, please turn on, on your camera and confirm that you are ready to start the lecture. Please share your screen now using the share screen button on the bottom of the application. Muszę zmienić nie to, to, nie tą prezentację. Dłuń, tak? Sure. Do you see oh, yes, we can see your presentation now. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, um, my heart is full of pain when I see pictures like this, the way of teaching medicine through the computer without having any contact with the patients is really terrible. I, I also imagine you at home just, you know, do, writing some notes, looking for, for the screen of your computer and trying to be doctor without having any contact with the, with the patient. I miss, and I hope that all of you, you miss also the moments like this, that after examining of the patient, checking the tests, you have time for the discussion, discussion on, about the patients and also about some other problems. This is the proper relation, the doctor and the patients, and nothing is gonna replace such a relation. Unfortunately, it looks like the future is the telemedicine, that the doctor will contact the patient through the computer, through the media. And can you imagine some old fashioned, not even old fashioned, but old patient having some problems with the computer and trying to explain about his problems to the doctor or another patient who may have old fashioned computer 
which will be unable to have a good connection with the doctor or even to enable him to show the proper results and so on. Hopefully the technology will go forward that the telemedicine will be like this, that the doctors will be going out of the screen and will be examining the patients. But of course, this is difficult to imagine. And also in this heavy time, the doctor and student is left with all his problems, full of paper, full of thoughts. He has no idea what the next step should be and so on and so on. And you know, he's looking for the papers, for the results and, and many other things and has no any idea many, very often, you know, especially when there are some difficult cases, what the next step should be. So this is the proper relation. The young doctor or a student with the older doctor, they are examining the patients, discussing and sharing experience, especially the old one to, to the young one. And also having good time after that. Hopefully we miss moments like this. So the title of my presentation was, do we need mentor in medicine and how to choose the right mentor? And who is mentor? Mentor is someone who impairs and shares wisdom and shares the knowledge with some people who are like experienced, younger. And usually this relation is dyadic and hierarchical. Dyadic because the relation is between two people, the mentor and the mentee. Hierarchical because the mentor is usually several years older. And also he is a teacher, advisor, sponsor for, for the young mentee. So why do we have to have mentor? Because the mentor of, offers guidance and advice. He also is usually powerful, have many connections. So he may have some opportunity which may provide to us. Also, he usually is advising to take right steps, make right moves and advocates for you locally, nationally and internationally. So you, what you will become in the future, what your career will look, will depend on you and the mentor. It was also proven, you know, scientifically, there was a survey performed among more than 1200 academic medical faculty. And the question was, what influenced the satisfaction in, the, in their career? And this satisfaction was correlated with time spent with the mentor, mentor's behavior, extent of mentoring in various roles, and also some other things which I show you on the slide. This is the icon of surgery, William Halstead. William Halstead was the first chief of surgery in John Hopkins in Baltimore, and he transformed surgical education by creating the residency program. Can you imagine that the guy in the 19th century created a residency program which exists with some small changes until today in the United States? It's difficult to imagine what was his vision. He was really one of the great, greatest people in the surgery in our all history. During his tenure in the university, the very model example of relations between the mentor and mentee was the pair with William Osler and Harvey Cushing, which I will present you maybe a little bit later. So as I told you, this program, which was established by Halstead, did have not been changed until 2003. And because the Accreditation Council for Graduate and Medical Education established 80 hour week before the young residents had to work much, much, much longer. And during my stay, my work in the United States, I used to work in the Washington DC and in Georgetown University, first three years of, uni of the residency, 
the residents had to be on call 15 times a month. And there was no any free day after the call. So you may imagine that the young residents were on call or they were after the call, but always in the hospital. So there were some protests that the users know this is like abusing of, uh, of the young residents and there was some committee and they also told that if they, this situation like this will um, last longer, they will cancel the residency program, but advocates of this residency pro program said that, of course, they know that the 15 days in the month, the young residents are in the hospital, but the bad thing of, of this is that they still miss 50% of interesting cases. But of course, we have also to understand that this change of the hours dedicated to surgery will influence the proper teaching of the young surgeon who, who will become the, the old surgeon because nothing is going to replace experience spent in the ORs. So that's why we need some other type of education and also the role of mentor is very, very import, important. What factors may affect the mentor-mentee relationship? Of course, gender, male or female, whatever, culture, interest, some hobby, work, life balance. In academic surgery, we uh, faced different type of surgeries. There was called so-called silent generation, which were graduating in those three years, 25 to 45, baby boom generation, generation X and generation Y. Also, the very important issue, there is bigger and bigger percentage of women entering the residency program in surgery. Already in States, it's, I think, close to 30 or 40 percent also in other countries of the Europe and as well many many women became the chairmen of the surgical department which of course has changed this situation because usually no one could imagine woman as a chair in the surgery also in such a surgical departments we have mixture of culture, mixture of different types of surgeons which were trained in different countries, different culture, different regions. So in many, many departments, we have the surgeons training in Latin Europe, Latin America, German Europe, Nordic Europe, Eastern Europe, and of course, Southern Asia, and so on and so on. That's, that's why I think being very well trained and also educated surgeon, which will uh, be the same or even the, the better than the others is very important. Of course, the baby boomers, this is like an old fashioned uh, surgeon who could perform any type, type of surgery, usually as on call. What about his research, usually there were studies based on the retrospective reviews. The Y generation, the modern surgeons, usually they are focused on the smaller, not maybe smaller, but more specific fields in surgery, like foregut, HPB or colorectal. Usually they don't want to take a call. If they do research, usually this is the basic research. So being good, surgeon on, or if you want to be good surgeon, you have to dedicate oh, a lot of time to surgery. Especially if you have academic positions, you are of course obliged to write some manuscript, books in the chapters, or, or even the books. You are invited to other universities to, to give a talks for invited lecture. Usually you are a member of different societies. And if you are really very good, you are elected to be a president or being in executive committee or also you, you serve in the uh, boards, but of course nothing is for free. On the other side is the balance, times dedicated to family, to friends, to sports, and of course to your free time.
In the program, mentorship, there are some key elements. Of course, who is the mentor? Who is the mentee? Where do they work? In which medical school as well? So mentors usually are individuals because if mentee wants to choose one, he doesn't want to, to choose very, you know, average surgeon. He wants to, 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 to choose a leader or somebody who, who, who is, you know, individual and, and so on. So these individuals who have desire to leave a legacy that gives additional meaning to their professional and personal life. They acknowledge the benefits and activity, and of course, research productivity, increased professional recognition, and so on. They must be honest, patient, of course, supportive, accessible, and have a good communication still. Today, in the era of the modern world, to become a mentor is very, very challenging due to the fact of the work hours dedicated to works. And of course, financial pressures by the management of, of the hospital and a work-life balance. Of course, your wife or your husband wants you to be in, 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 at home. And of course, probably this pressure is as much strong as from the management of the hospital as well. There are a few types of the mentors. Usually, I listed four types of mentors. The type parent, the godfather, big brother, and the patron. And I will try to explain you what do I mean by this listing. The parent usually is trusty, open, honest, committed to your best interest. He treats you like a son. He wants you to create as him, has connections, power, resources, maybe not as much as a godfather, but you, you must have spontaneous trust in your parent mentor because he wishes you all the best. He wants to make career like he has. The godfather usually is very powerful, has many, many connections, gives clear direction, provides for your needs at a cost. The Godfather's priority are first. It may be difficult to be independent having this relation with the Godfather. Then as a relation is a big brother, big sister relation between the mentor and mentee. Usually, he's usually a little bit older than you, you are, He's a trusted person you can turn to for advice, may not have the best answers because he's still not experienced, he's a little bit more experienced than you are, may not have the resources, the power, may have the same struggles as you. And the patron usually is a distant supporter. You may have some projects together, but you don't work for him. He is successful, has connection as well as a godfather. He is willing to help you and receive little or nothing in return. The criteria for, of a good mentor is the generosity, interest, and wisdom. And as, again, I'm showing you the very model pair of mentee and mentor. Generosity of what? Of time dedicated to the mentee expertise and the credit. Nobody has enough time. Time given to mentee is of course time taken away from your family. And my idol Leonardo da Vinci also realized that the time is everything. So he was sleeping only two hours a, a day and he was trying not to lose time to write with one hand and to paint with the another one. So this was really, really strange, but he really realized that time is really everything. Of course, if you're gonna choose someone who has position in the university, so the most time has the assistant professor. 
he's not much involved in some administration and some other things, like for example, associate professor, who still may dedicate a lot of time to you. But if you look for the professor, usually he doesn't have much time to help you or to dedicate his time for you. So you have to realize this. Generosity of expertise. So he has to be open. He must show you everything, he, what he knows, what his experience is. He has, uh, this expertise requires vision, mastery. He has to be absolutely champion in everything. And of course, security. The generosity of credit is usually informal, formal on a day-to-day -day basis. But of course, someone who may be a mentor after some years will be out of the scene and some other younger guys will replace him. I think in sport, it's very easy to see that the time is the great equalizer. We could see in 2012, Roger Federer was unbeaten tennis player. A couple of years ago, Novak Djokovic, he still is playing. He's still a very good tennis player. Terrible thing which you may meet, especially in your career, is to meet or to co-work with the mentor who has a prima donna complex. He thinks he's the best, but very often he's not the best. Only he has feeling like this and he treats the other people in a very special way. So how to find a mentor? Informal mentorship pairing is choose someone who you like and respect because you, you've been uh, having you know, lectures and you met some younger doctors, older doctors in different departments, somebody also who shares your values and ethics. Because if you will be co-working with someone who has another ethics and you know another values, you know, point of view on the life and many other things, this relation is not going to work. Somebody who treasures mentoring younger people, someone who is knowledgeable in your area and interests. Formal mentoring pairing, you have to go to the chairman to help you to find somebody who's going to work with you. There is five domains in which mentee usually needs help. In research, he really doesn't know very often what is the hot topic, what, what, what are some researchers are working on. He needs also to develop methodology, funding collaborators, also since help in drafting manuscripts and writing grants. Grants In professional development, he also needs to help in establishing career goals, creating effective network system, choosing jobs, what is good for, for you, what is bad. Skill development, of course, managing time, resources, and clinical skills. Academic guidance, understanding the culture of the department, and the institution. And of course, in personal life, establishing a balance between professional and personal life. So you may have also a few mentors. Don't, it's not necessary or obligatory, so you may have one mentor. So you may have a mentor which will be guiding you in the clinical work and another one, one who's gonna guide you in the research. You have one mentor who's gonna be with you in the same university or you may have some idol away from another university or even another country. You may have, of course, the present mentor or somebody who will become later the, the past one and you will find another one. There is also somebody who knows how the work should be, uh, look, and also someone who is really, will give you some advice on how the life, your life should look, look. And also some other stuff. So being a mentee, you have always to have mentors. You never outgrow the need. You search for mentors to add to your team. You have to, uh, in work to be ideal mentee and remember, this is always two-way street. 
The department, the chair, the chief has to recognize the importance of this relation. The chair cannot wait passively for junior and senior. So usually the chair must assume the active role and must recognize the many benefits which result from effective program, which I have listed you here on this slide. Important elements in the mentorship program is identifying mentors, assessing a pairing of mentors with mentees, having contracts, designing formal curriculum for mentees, but very important is monitoring on the mentor-mentee relationship and intervening when necessary, because this is really important. Of course, you choose the mentor, you think this the, the ideal one, you think this is absolutely your God, but unfortunately, this relation may fail. So this is also may fail from the reason and fault of the mentor, because he may be usually overcritical, inadequate, giving you adequate direction. And unfortunately, it may also does happen. He is taking the results of your work, research, publications, patents, and so on, which of course is not honest, but of course it does happen. But also it may be from the fault of the mentee who is not performing according to initial plan, he lacking respect for, for the mentor. So how to exit a failed relationship? I don't have any really proper, advice but i think just the open discussion you know and explaining all the things may help but also you in the future will become a mentors whenever you do it well or not it will become your most durable legacy the people will remember you what you have done for them so take home message about your career career Yes, plan your career, absolutely. Don't leave to the, you know, lack. Enjoy the journey and hopefully time is over. Thank you for your attention. And I wish you many moments like this to enjoy life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dickey, for a great lecture. Uh, so, dear participants, if you have any questions, this is the right time to write them down in our live chat. So, dear professor, we we'll wait a minute uh, to for any questions from the participants. Okay. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Of course. This is you know. I was thinking what to tell you, but I think you know that many of you are interested in many different topics. You know. You do research in ophthalmology, laryngology, surgery, basic uh, science, and so on. So that's why I have chosen, you know, very general topic to 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 advise you how to plan your life. Yeah, that's right. All of us have different paths of careers, but I think that your lecture was quite universal, cool. so it could help many people. Hopefully. So I wish you all the luck and I wish you to choose the right mentor and to, 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 to have your career very successful. Thank you. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so no questions uh, are on the live chat. So thank you again, Professor. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you on our conference. And our next keynote speaker is PhD Monica Gadis, an associate professor at University of Missouri in Kansas City School of Medicine. The topic of her lecture is modern medical care in the world of translational and precision medicine. Dear professor, please turn on your camera and confirm that you are ready to start the lecture. Okay, so you are sharing your screen now. You can see your presentation. Uh, I guess it's right time to start. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear okay, you. Perfect. Well, I'm Dr. Monica Gaddis, and I'm from the University of Missouri-Kansas City School of Medicine. And today I'm going to discuss 
uh, Modern Medical Care in the World of Translational and Precision Medicine. So medicine has dramatically changed since the turn of the century, even the 20th or the 21st century. There's been an explosion of patient data collected thanks to the use of the electronic medical record. And the human genome mapped earlier has been exploited for improvements in treatments for various diseases. And the trajectory of bench to bedside knowledge has shortened. And together these developments have led to a more personalized approach to medical care. So research is a very broad word, but according to the dictionary, research is the systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. So I'm presenting this slide, this definition, because this is a talk about the power of research and its impact on modern day medicine. So medical research has three distinct areas. We have basic science research, which establishes the foundation of medical knowledge. This involves in vitro preparations, whole animals and or chemicals and compounds, and then clinical research studies, treatments and technologies as applied to human beings. But finally, there's translational research. Now, translational research has been defined as the application of the scientific method to address a health need. This sounds pretty familiar. The purpose of translational research is to quickly transform and apply theoretical knowledge and experimental breakthroughs into new health products and diagnostic and therapeutic tools. Now, the operative word for modern day translational research is quickly. Translational research is the link between bench, basic science research, and bedside, the patient application. So let's take a look backwards, not all that long ago. Historically, research began in the laboratory, still does, and from here the findings were applied to the human inside or outside of the clinic. If the findings have been positive or helpful, guidelines for treatments were developed and newly found knowledge was translated to the patient. This pathway of research, however, was a one-way street. So now, notice that we have research separated into two phases of translational gaps, T1 and T2. The first phase, T1, refers to the translation of knowledge from bench to research or basic science research into a potential clinical product. So we're going from bench to human research. Next, T2, here we go, refers to applying the clinical research findings to the actual practice of healthcare, as we talked about earlier. Now, in the past, much of research, both basic science and human, was done in a bubble, meaning basic scientists completed basic science research and clinicians completed clinical human research, and their paths really didn't cross. This non-collaborative process resulted in a very slow trajectory for the translation of knowledge from bench to bedside. And this time period of translation is reported to be about 17 years. This is very long and very unacceptable. So why 17 years? This is an amazingly long time. There's many reasons for this delay. Of course, no one, nobody wants to make a mistake and approve a product or treatment that's going to be harmful. So the research process itself was and still is laborious to prevent error. Now there's many steps in the research process that have to be completed before the treatment reaches the patient. From obtaining funding to completion of the multiple steps of research to the many regulatory steps, basically research takes a lot of time but there's tragic fallout from this very slow process. People die and they die needlessly. So the solution to the problem of extended time from bench to bedside is via improved translational research. If the process is successful, then the time from bench to bedside will decrease. So I just stated translational research has been happening. It's been happening forever. So th this is not a new concept. Knowledge has always been translated from bench to humans and from humans to bedside. But also recall that it took a long time on this one-way street of research and a lot has changed. 
The focus of modern day medicine in translational research is to quickly transform and apply this new knowledge to healthcare. So how have we done this? Well, importantly, the reverse flow of information, materials and skills returning to the laboratory bench from the clinic has happened. This is crucial for more rapid scientific progression. Basic science research is now modeled by a continuous back and forth interaction with the clinic. And this reverse flow of information from the clinic is critical for scientific progression. Considering this, the Nobel laureate biologist, Sidney Brenner, stressed the importance of failed clinical trials and patients' unexpected responses as valuable human experiments, as he termed them, to stimulate new hypotheses that may help redefine the route of the next iteration of inquiry. Modern day translational medicine has many more phases of translation. As always, the research begins at the bench and is translated to humans. And then once successful, the information gained moves to clinical application. But clinical successes allow for widespread adoption of the new knowledge by various medical practices. And finally, that knowledge becomes a standard in the community of medical care. And so modern translational medicine is a cycle of knowledge translation with many steps of adoption. And it actually moves backwards and forwards. As we see here, it's a cycle. It moves from the lab back to the lab to improve knowledge. So now you should all be thinking modern translational research and adoption of knowledge should go slower, not faster, because it now moves backwards and forwards and there are additional steps. But there's more change that will bring about a faster speed to translate knowledge from bench to bedside. And that change is collaboration. In modern translational research and medicine, researchers and clinicians work together to create and evaluate new applications for healthcare. Collaboration merges people with differing expertise to facilitate the focused research and the shared decision-making in the research processes and creating relevant research. Modern translational research in medicine has also been greatly impacted by an explosive growth in available data. The rapid technological developments that have occurred in all fields of biomedical research has led to a significant increase in data availability boosting data dimensionality and interaction ability. Additionally, the validation of new data variables coming from the availability of what we call omics data has contributed to new frameworks of translational research and personalized medicine. For example, the number of variables on which the clinical decision process currently relies in the field of oncology is significant. Decision-making is no longer limited to just a few variables, but instead thousands. Besides omics data, real-world data is available. Now, real-world data is data collected from electronic medical records, registries, insurance-related databases, or through surveys and mobile applications. The availability of real-world data-based applications represents an alternative to traditional research. The use of real-world data is invaluable for cohort studies using data to define and model and describe patient-centered outcomes. The benefits of secondary real-world data are numerous. Along with the ability to more easily study patient-centered outcomes with fewer limits on patient inclusion, real-world data allows for assessment of the benefits and risks of treatments, devices, and procedures and medications, as well as their effectiveness. Speed to conduct research using real-world data is fast as compared to randomized control trials. And use of real-world data can actually be inexpensive and it's easier to protect patient subject privacy through systematic de-identification of the data. But there's also limitations like everything. Data is collected during and for medical care, not principally for research. With this, the data, has, the data that is collected may be lacking in structural characteristics for necessary granularity of research. It must be remembered that clinicians input data for medical care and training them to prioritize research over patient care may and probably will negatively impact the quality of care given. Also, the data taken from the electronic medical records and other databases might be inaccurate and or incomplete for research needs. 
In this vein, the quality and completeness of data varies within and among databases. So quality checks are needed to validate data. Additionally, heterogeneity of data has to be accounted for. Missing data is always a problem that has to be considered. And finally, there are privacy concerns that have to be addressed, especially considered genetic data. Limitations aside, there's many real world data sets of quality for use in research and understanding the data set in terms of the information and contained, the structure, the de-identification applications, how much is missing and the quality of that data before using the data set for research can result in valid and useful information. Some data sets available for use from the public domain are found on many university library websites. This is my link for my university. Because of the single payer attributes of many European country healthcare systems, yes, I'm jealous of that. That would be wonderful to have access to those. Several countries have extensive and relatively complete medical record databases available to researchers and clinicians from that country or to those practicing medicine or having institutional affiliation in the country. Also a benefit is that these European database or data sets are often able to be used for longitudinal research because of their completeness. So where are we now with translational medicine and research? Well, translational medicine initiatives throughout the world have been established to accelerate research for specific diseases and conditions. Translational research and medicine initiatives have been established in the US at the NIH and in Europe with the European Infrastructure for Translational Medicine. Journals dedicated to translational research and medicine are growing in numbers of both journal and published articles. Webinars and conferences dedicated to translational research and medicine are also growing in frequency. And the fifth international conference on translational medicine is being presented virtually in July of this year. Extensive secondary real world databases are increasing in number with many publicly available now. And finally, new technologies have enabled faster translation. So now let's discuss these new technologies and their impact on translational medicine and their link to precision medicine. Healthcare has evolved from a traditional approach through stratification and finally to precision. Traditional medicine typically was a one size fits all approach. Stratified medicine is a bit better considering how drugs and therapies and devices and tests performed in specific groups. Now, stratifications can be set by things like race, sex, age, and the like. But again, even within those groups, treatments that work for some patients don't always work for others. Thus, it was recognized that improvement was needed. And this improvement led to precision medicine. Precision medicine is a unique and innovative approach to medical care. Precision medicine considers genomics and omics, lifestyle, preferences, health history, and many exogenous factors and determines the treatment approaches for a given patient. And the outcome is more of an individualized approach to treatment. So logically, clinicians have always tried to treat each patient as an individual, even when treatments were one size fits all. So question is, is precision medicine a new construct or one that's been in existence for a long time, but now is wrapped up in a nice shiny package, i.e. a word, initiated thanks to the technological developments. Well, actually it's a bit of both. It's old and it's new. Also consider the name. According to the National Research Council in the United States, personalized medicine is an older term with a meaning similar to precision medicine. Therefore, the US preserves, pre prefers the term precision medicine. In Europe, precision medicine is termed personalized medicine. Very similar definition is that used in the United States for precision medicine. But there's more terms globally. We have stratified medicine, individualized medicine, genomic medicine, you get the idea. So semantics aside, personalized precision medicine is the same. Excuse me. Let me go back here, there we go. The definition of precision medicine was first presented by the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology in 2008 in the United States. 
And this definition suggests that the power of precision medicine lies in the ability to guide healthcare decisions towards a more effective treatment. The first noted initiative came in January of 2015 from then President Barack Obama when he announced the launch of the Precision Medicine Initiative. So Europe followed close behind in December of 2015 when the Council of the European Union met and discussed their intent to implement personalized medicine. Then less than a year later, the International Consortium for Personalized Medicine was launched with 24 European member nations in Canada. Its mission, much like that of the US, is to establish Europe as a global leader in personalized medicine by directing a coordinated approach to research, paving the way for personalized medicine for its citizens. Specifically, precision medicine success is dependent upon the roles of genetics and behaviors, social and environmental factors. Precision medicine focuses on disease treatment and prevention, and it considers variability in genes, environment, and lifestyle between individual patients. And finally, precision medicine applies evidence-based insights derived from population level studies. So let's delve a little deeper into what is needed for successfully developing and applying precision medicine. This discussion would not even start, have started without several more recent technological developments. And these include the Human Genome Project, the development of omics, and finally, the new science of informatics. This triad represents the cornerstone of precision medicine. So let's talk the Human Genome Project. The year 2003 marked the successful completion of the mapping of the human genome. Scientists across six nations worked together to sequence the entire human genome. And this endeavor irreversibly changed health research and healthcare application. As an example, the knowledge of the genome led to identification of genetic mutations related to pathologies like the BRCA genes for breast cancer. Also, pharmacogenetic tests to determine drug metabolizing capacity were developed. This leads to prescribing the right drug and the right dose for the right person. In 2012, the UK launched the 100,000 Genomes Project. This is, this is administered by the UK Biobank. It has members worldwide, which I'm a member of the UK Biobank. The purpose of this project was to sequence 100,000 genomes of people with cancer or rare diseases and their immediate family members, and then to match those genomic records with National Health Service medical record demographic, social, and clinical information. The purpose of the project was to use the data to carry out research for new diagnoses, methodologies, and to improve treatments for patients. Nicely, this endeavor was successfully completed in 2018. That was really fast. It was expanded at first to include 1 million more genomes, and then finally to include 5 million genomes. Data collection still ongoing. The US followed in 2015 with the All of Us Research Program. This is administered by the NIH. The goal here is to collect the genomes of 1 million volunteers for study of donor genomes and health status. The intent is to improve prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of cancer and to guarantee access to cutting edge cancer treatments for all and collection on this database is ongoing. Yet another really important genomics database and analysis is by the Pan-Cancer Analysis of Whole Genomes Consortium. This is made up of the International Cancer Genome Consortium and the Cancer Genome Atlas. This data compilation analysis is an interdisciplinary worldwide effort, and it uses international data analyzed using compute clouds. clouds. The manuscript from this effort called Cancer Genome Sequencing and Analysis was published in Nature last year. Importantly, data sets from this endeavor have now been made publicly available. Additional translational initiatives are worth mentioning. Italy's ACC Germsum project has been impactful as has the Generator Artificial Intelligence Project. And the European Commission also sponsors and supports many translational precision medicine initiatives. So the Human Genome Project set the stage for precision medicine with the advent of genomics databases available for research. So now let's talk omics. 
Omics refers to a collection like, of like biological molecules, genes, et cetera, that work to define the structure and function of an organism. The technologic gains experienced recently opened the door for development of omics. There are several omics that are closely related to medicine. All of them are here. I'm only gonna talk about a couple of them. Of course, genomics, we just went over that. Next, epigenomics. This is of great importance. The epigenome consists of chemical compounds that modify or mark the genome in a way that alters the instructions given by DNA. Metabolomics is the study of metabolites. Collectively, metabolites and their interactions within a biological system are known as the metabolome. This is the molecular phenotype. And lastly, there's this grand transcriptome. This moderates gene activity. The third of the triad is informatics. This is the collection analysis of omics data that could not occur without informatics. According to AMIA, one of the first informatics organizations in the world, biomedical informatics is the interdisciplinary scientific field that studies and pursues the effective uses of biomedical information and data and knowledge for science inquiry. Problem solving and decision making, all motivated by the efforts to improve human health. So, this is the driving force of technology behind precision medicine and translational research. Statistical methodologies have existed for hundreds of years, but computers have not. So, with the advent of the computer and incorporation into mainstream use, databases have grown in size. And with those data sets, analysis technologies have evolved and developed. Programming languages like Python and SQL and HTML have been created for the handling of these large data, data sets. Computers can be programmed to think and act like a human with artificial intelligence. Recognition that not all data is easily accessed because it's not directly translatable, translatable to binary or hexadecimal representation gives rise to natural language processing NLP is still in its infancy, but will be of great value when refined to pull data from written clinical notes. And finally, machine learning is a specialized AI analysis methodology that's used to create statistical models from large sets of data. This is based on the idea that once programmed, systems can learn from data, identify patterns, and make decisions with minimal human interaction, like I said, once programmed. Considering the previously mentioned developments and technologies, the various worldwide initiatives and the ability to generate and use data, the ultimate goal of precision medicine is to obtain the most detailed characterization of each patient by identifying genetic and molecular, um, excuse me, genetic and molecular characteristics by through omics technologies and then apply the knowledge gained to personalized medicine. So where are we now in this endeavor of precision medicine? What applications are we using to provide a more personalized care based on translational and individual evidence? They're everywhere. We now apply family histories to disease risk. We all talk about our family history and do we have a risk of cancer or heart disease? Personalized devices can keep track of healthcare information. We have apps on our phones that link us to our electronic medical records. We use social media for public health initiatives. And many of us wear smartwatches that can track activity, calories burned, and even run an EKG and obtain O2 sat. I have an Apple watch, it does all of this. And then it records it into my app for my health and my, and my medical record on my iPhone. There are many other examples of how precision medicine is being delivered listed here. And this is not an exhaustive list. Now let's apply the progression of translational research and the impact on precision medicine using a real life example, asthma. So why asthma? Well, chronic respiratory diseases affect more than a billion people worldwide. That's one sixth of the population. Asthma accounts for about a quarter of these people and the death rate is tremendous at almost a half a million people per year. This disease is sometimes preventable and when present is treatable and survivable. And it has an interesting history from recognition to modern day understanding thanks to extensive research. 
So Henry Hyde Salter was one of the first to write about asthma. He described it as paroxysmal dyspnea of a particular character with intervals of health respiration between attacks. He wrote the cause to be perverted nervous action. Interesting. Salter believed that asthma was hereditary and through a case study, he described asthma's relationship to idiosyncrasies, such as the emanations of horses, cats, and other animals. He also explained that an asthma attack could be triggered by emotions. He thought the best treatment was sleep and black coffee. The consequences of his writing was that asthma was then considered to be a distinct disease with a specific etiology, clinical consequence, and treatment. Then in 1892, Sir William Osler was impactful with his description of asthma in the medical text, Principles and Practice of Medicine, where he noted that asthma was a disease of bronchospasm. So from the early to mid 20th century, a lot of research happened and accepted asthma treatment was limited to theophylline, ephedrine, epinephrine, and isoprenaline. Later, the use of selective beta-2 agonists were included in the treatment options. And an interesting side story here, these were thought to be so safe that they became readily available in a few countries. And then there was a surge of deaths due to overuse in the UK, the US, Australia, and later in New Zealand. As research continued, IgE was linked to allergy asthma exacerbation in 1978. This led to a better understanding of the cellular level pathophysiology of an asthma attack. And the treatment recommended was inhaled corticosteroids. In the 1990s, T cells, specifically TH2, were found to be responsible for initiating the allergic cascade and with this discovery and other cell type, the dendritic cell was identified as an intermediary. Understanding each step of the cascade allowed for the development of better and more targeted treatments. With a better understanding of the genome beginning in the 1990s and into present day, it was found that genetic susceptibility and allergen exposure combined together to initiate the allergic cascade via the dendritic cell T cell communication. This allergic cascade then continued on to an, to an asthma exacerbation. It was also discovered that asthma associated allergens vary by genetic predisposition. Imagine that. Next, monoclonal antibody research began in earnest. Due to rapid advancements in genetic sequencing and the translation of basic medical sciences research into clinical practice, Humanized monoclonal antibodies are now the fastest growing group of biotechnology derived molecules in clinical trials. Monoclonal antibody treatment for allergic asthma now includes the UMABs. Now, because asthma is not a one size fits all disease as earlier thought, clinicians needed a way to classify the various severity levels of asthma. Now these change over time since the beginning of 2000 until now Current classifications are based on asthma severity, daytime symptoms, nighttime symptoms, and lung functions. Now, these should be familiar to many of you as clinicians. But these are generated, and they're generated from symptom-based findings. They don't consider the genetic or the pathophysiologic characteristics of asthma for an individual. So this brings us to phenotypes. Thanks to a century of asthma research, we now know that asthma is not one single disease. But how should we classify asthma in a more detailed manner, a more precise, personalized individual approach? Well, we do this through phenotyping. This is an approach that is available thanks to the advancements in technology and translational research. Now, there are multiple methods for phenotyping asthma. You will find these everywhere. But, these are, and, but they're all more detailed than the classifications that I presented earlier. For instance, here, a person with allergic asthma has exacerbations triggered by allergen exposure, such as pollen. It's likely to begin in childhood. It's associated with eosinic, eosinophilic um, inflammation. And the treatment based on the mechanism of the allergic cascade is inhaled corticosteroids. 
Now here's a way to classify inflammatory asthma phenotypes. Let's go back and look at allergic asthma again. Here, more detail is provided for the mechanism of action and subsequent treatment. So phenotyping asthma has been helpful in linking the type of asthma, the mechanisms of action for exacerbations and the treatments that act on those mechanisms. Phenotyping goes well beyond the four classification system. Phenotyping thus provides a precision medicine approach to the treatment of asthma. Now let's talk biomarkers. Biomarkers provide an even more precise information. A biomarker is a molecule that may be used to indicate the presence of a disease. Knowing biomarkers that are specific for a certain type of asthma will aid in asthma type identification and guide treatment. Now biomarkers for type two inflammatory asthma have been defined, but biomarkers for more difficult to treat asthma, which are not type two are less well-defined. So what are the biomarkers and how are they obtained? Well, one is assessment of a sputum sample. This can be used to determine the asthma phenotype. Sputum assessment provides the type and level of certain biomarkers, specifically eosinophil count and neutrophil count. An FENO test or exhaled nitric, nitric oxide test in patients with allergic or eosinophilic acid, asthma, excuse me, is a way to determine how much lung inflammation is present and how well the inhaled steroids are suppressing the inflammation. Serum IgE is a biomarker that mediates allergic reactions and plays an important role in allergic asthma exacerbations. Development of IgE targeted therapies have improved asthma outcomes in those with elevated blood IgE concentrations. To wrap up biomarkers, Biomarkers may be used diagnostically, identifying the severity, endotype, and treatment adherence. Biomarkers can be used for prediction to identify effective treatments and confirm the treatment response, and levels can be used to avoid treatment escalation. And finally, biomarkers can be prognostic, using their levels to reduce the risk of exacerbation and to decrease the risk of decline in lung function. Now recall, Early treatment of asthma was very limited. Use of theophylline and similar compounds was stumbled upon anecdotally because Henry Salter suffered from asthma himself. And he noted in his writings that black coffee reduced symptoms. Modern day treatment development has benefited from translational research resulting in a precision medicine approach. Current treatments include options that were never dreamed of a hundred plus years ago. So this list here represents available treatments for asthma in 2021. These have been developed because of improved understanding and research during the past hundred years. I'm not gonna read all of these, you guys can read these, but please note we have come a very long way from black coffee. But the evolution of treatment of asthma is not limited to chemical treatment. Much has also been learned about the many types of asthma during that time frame, And because of the Human Genome Project and improved technologies and translational research, we've learned that exposure to allergens as well as maintaining a healthy lifestyle are quote unquote treatments that have significant impact on sufferers of asthma. So basically, asthma is a complex and varied disease and one that's been impacted by the benefits of translational research and medicine and precision medicine. It took more than a century of study, but asthma has moved from the narrow confines of Osler's definition of the disease to one that is complex and multifaceted. Thanks to omic sciences and research using advanced technologies, several phenotypes have been defined. Endotypes, subtypes of a disease have been identified and more will more likely be identified the by the discovery of even additional biomarkers. Because of the advancements brought about by translational research, specific or precise treatment is now being deployed and thus asthma treatment is no longer one size fits all. So in summary, advances in technologies, the establishment of new disciplines, 
and the development of new areas of knowledge have impacted the practice of medicine in ways never before imagined. The sentinel event in this progress was the mapping of the human genome. And finally, worldwide initiatives and widespread institutional and government support have also impacted the speed of the acquisition of knowledge and the application of such to precision medicine. In closing, as you move forward in your medical careers, when you are treating a patient or reading of a new treatment, always remember the origins of your practice and the progress that has been made through the years. But most of all, become a part of the future. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Monika, for your lecture. Uh, so let's check uh, whether there are any questions at our live chat, okay? Just a minute. Oh, uh, I have some questions from the students. So Monika, if you could please answer. Yes. So I'm reading it. What would you say to students who'd like to become researchers but don't think that they're talented enough? Uh, what is the most important success factor for you in science? Oh, I suppose that it is a question for the previous professor, Jiki. So maybe we'll try to connect to him and then he will answer. But we have a question for you, Professor Monika, as well. So. In your opinion, what are the biggest obstacles to implementation of precision medicine in common practice? Money, that's one of the biggest. Um, precision medicine takes the science and the knowledge and the development, and that, that's a big obstacle to, to be able to have enough money to do the research. There are brilliant people out there that have great ideas, but getting funding for research is very difficult. Even in the United States, um, when we have big grants from um, the NIH or from other large uh, well-known organizations, like for instance, American Heart Association, American Cancer Society, um, these institutions don't fund the majority of grant applications that come in. It used to be in the early 90s that something like 90% of applications were funded and now something like 10 to 20% are funded. And so people that wanna do research can't get the funding. The other thing is, is that it still does take time to go from bench to bedside. And that's, that's a big problem. And I understand why, because we have to maintain patient safety. Um, but we just proved during COVID-19 that using science as we know it, and those vaccines were developed from old science, you know, science from back during SARS-1, that we can put together medications, treatments, et cetera, that can move fast through the pipeline and be very, very effective. And so I hope that what we've learned here is that the, one of the biggest roadblocks, which is time, will be overcome by, by what we've learned with our COVID vaccine development. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and it was my mistake. The previous question was also for you, Professor Gallis. So if I may, I read it out again. What would you say to students who would like to become researchers but don't think are talented enough? What is the most important success factor for you in science? Okay, so let's, go, let's do the first one first. First of all, I believe anybody can do research. I think that it's, it's learning about research. So I teach, for instance, we have a medical school. Um, we're one of three in the country in the United States that's a six-year medical school like the European model. So our students come to us straight out of high school and they study with us for six years. I teach research to the medical students. That's part of my job. So we have a third year research um, uh, curriculum that, that I'm responsible for. And I find so many students who get very, very excited about research once they learn the components of how to do research. 
If you're in medical school and studying to be a physician, you can easily do research. You, you have the knowledge and the ability. You, what you don't have is you don't know the tools and those can be learned and you can pick a mentor and be guided. And I've seen people that started from no knowledge at all and now they're very well published researchers. So I think that's, that's really important. And then the, can you read me the second part of that question? Of course, no problem. What is the most important success factor for you in science? Perseverance for everybody. I think not just for me, but for everybody. Ideas are easy to come by. You as physicians are going to be able to come by ideas in clinical practice. You're going to be seeing a patient and you're going to think, why is this happening? And it leads to research projects. The problem is research takes time and effort and just persevering, make, just staying with it and working hard. And when you don't get results that you want, try again, because you might ask a question in a different way, learn new technologies, but just keep working hard to be able to do what you wanted to do. Yesterday, I served in a jury and listened to um, uh, students in anesthesiology and emergency medicine present their projects they went from the most basic project to the most technologically advanced project, but all of those projects had the same thing in common. Those people through all of their difficulties persevered. They worked hard at it and kept pushing forward to be successful. And that's what it takes. Okay. And we have one more question. Is there any danger that the achievements of precision personalized medicine would become just a privilege for the wealthy and would not be available for underprivileged patients? Yes, it's a big concern, especially when treatments are very expensive. And we, we see that obviously in the United States, we have a healthcare system in the United States that is totally packed with disparity. And if you have money, because you know we pay for our health care, it's not provided by our government. And so if you don't have the money, you can't get the care. And if you do have the money, you can get the care. And that's that's the sad thing about precision medicine. So yes, I, I'm a, I won't get political here, but I think the European system is far superior to ours because at least there's access, there's a base access for everybody. I also think that in third world countries that are less developed, precision medicine treatments, which are going to be very expensive because they're new and cutting edge will not be available. And I think that's a, that's a sad thing. And even though the, the, the mission of the United States and Europe's initiatives say individualized healthcare for all, I don't think that that's going to be possible given the expense. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Monika Gadis. Uh, as well, for the lecture and for the answers for the questions. So I believe that now it is high time for the lecture of Professor Gary Gaddis. Uh, professor Gary Gaddis has served as a professor of emergency medicine at the Washington University in St. Louis School of Medicine. His lecture's title is Procedural Sedation. Dear Professor, please turn on your camera and confirm that you are ready to start your lecture. Hello, I am ready to start the lecture. Can you hear me well and see my slides? Yes, of course. Okay. We can hear you and we see your presentation. Very well, thank you. I'm going to talk about a very practical tool called procedural sedation, especially given that the this is a, um, I, I was asked to talk about something that involved anesthesia and emergency medicine. Just briefly, I wanna go through my conflicts of interest though to let you judge any possible bias I might have. I receive honoraria from the Journal of Emergency Medicine as an associate editor and from the American College of Emergency Physicians as a course director for their Emergency Medicine Basic Research Skills course. And then my wife and I both co-own stock of Johnson & Johnson, a healthcare company. Those I don't think will be relevant to my talk today, but it's always important to talk about potential conflicts. I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to speak and uh, speak about an uh, issue that's been controversial in the United States and I would imagine in other countries also, and that is procedural sedation, because um, in most hospitals, anest the anesthesia department controls sedation and anesthesia procedures, 
And anesthesiologists at first in our country wanted to be the only people who could provide procedural sedation. But what they couldn't provide was the availability 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so cooperation between emergency medicine and anesthesia developed. Um, and so now emergency physicians can use some of the newer medicines that enable sedation, just like anesthesiologists. I know that in Poland, you also have a relative shortage of anesthesia because I've communicated with the conference leadership. And I know that this is an issue for you too. In the States, 10 to 15 years ago, all we could use was midazolam. And now we have the ability to use some of the newer drugs. Um, so anyway, that's the background. Today, the objectives, we'll talk about procedural sedation, we'll talk about when and why we do it commonly, and also some uncommon indications. We'll talk about the vocabulary of procedural sedation. We'll talk about different levels of sedation so we understand how sedated somebody needs to be. We'll talk about who's qualified to take people to different levels of sedation. We'll talk about the general goals of sedations. We'll talk about how to prepare to sedate the patient to enable a safe procedure. We'll talk about which medications to use and the importance of a timeout where we go through the final preparations. We'll talk about how to monitor the patient for safety during the procedure. Then we'll wrap it up with a summary. So what is procedural sedation? It's a technique of administering sedatives or dissociative agents without analgesics according to the American College of Emergency Physicians clinical policy on the matter. And we do this in a manner that lets a patient tolerate unpleasant procedures while maintaining spontaneous cardiorespiratory function. So we stop short of a full anesthetic. And what we can do with procedural sedations is to calm the patient and make the patient not remember a disagreeable procedure. And procedural sedation itself is a procedure that when it's done right, just like the bright white light in the men in black, it won't let you remember. So the goal of procedural sedation is that the patient is amnestic, of, has no memory of this, the procedure that they undergo. And here's a procedure in the making. How would you like to be this Arsenal football player who has just sustained a fracture dislocation to his ankle? Would you want to go redu undergo a reduction of that without sedation? I think not. Procedural sedation is an act of mercy for inhumane procedures that would be awful to undergo if one was fully awake. This looks like the ankle of a patient I just saw last evening on an evening shift with the bone of the fracture dislocation at the ankle tenting the skin and threatening to convert this closed injury to an open one. This is a place where procedural sedation is needed. Or how would you like to be a person that had this cardiac rhythm with a low blood pressure and clear indications for cardioversion who wants to be awake for that cardioversion shock that you're going to receive? I know I'd rather be sedated. I think you would too. So commonly we use procedural sedation for assisting fracture reduction, dislocation reduction, and cardioversion, but we also can use it other ways. There are some areas of the body, such as in the axilla, where it's difficult to utilize local anesthesia to get sufficient anesthesia to enable humane, humane drainage of the abscess. This is a person that would benefit from procedural sedation. Foreign body removal from the ear or nose of a child can be benefited by procedural sedation. And removal of a foreign body or a fecal impaction in an adult is another indication for procedural sedation that's less commonly utilized. Wound repairs in small children are indications for sedation to enable successful uh, repair, successful cosmetic repair without the child moving around and making that difficult. Incision and drainage of abscesses, like I've mentioned, are sometimes usefully done with sedation. How would you like to undergo the incision of a thrombus hemorrhoid with just local anesthetic when you know that that's a difficult area to anesthetize? So we use procedural sedations for um, treating these thrombus hemorrhoids, and uh, it's an act of mercy. How many of you have encountered patients with hernias that are incarcerated, wherever the location? If you try to reduce the hernia, it's very painful. If you sedate the patient, the patient won't have any memory of your reduction of the hernia, and it's much more humane. So there's lots of common indications and, and other indications. Testicular torsion. How would you like to have a testicular torsion and have it reduced when you're fully awake? How about luxated teeth? How about lumbar punctures for some patients who are afraid of them? How about a penile zipper implant? I'm sorry, in zipper entrapment. There's lots of reasons that people could benefit from procedural sedation well beyond simply reduction of dislocations 
or, or sedation for cardioversions. Uh, there's a principle, general principle for procedural sedation in the ED, which says this, the primary goal in the emergency care setting is to main, manage pain and anxiety while enabling an, e, an immediate interventional procedure and to do that in a humane fashion. Some people used to talk about conscious sedation, but that's not really a precise term. We should be talking about procedural sedation or else procedural sedation and analgesia because we do this procedure when the patient is somnolent but not fully anesthetized. And to do this safely, we have to know a lot about airway anatomy and physiology, and we have to know the pharmacology of the sedatives and analgesics we use. We also must be alert for cardiac dysrhythmia and vigilant for complications of sedation such as hypoventilation or hypercarbia. We have to be able to secure an airway. And other than anesthesiologists, who is better at securing airways than emergency physicians? And the answer is nobody. We can do this skill. We can also initiate cardiac resuscitation if necessary, and we can identify how sedated we have, with, have taken the patient to by their various responses. So let's examine levels of sedation more closely. There's minimal sedation, which is basically making someone less anxious. That's not enough sedation for these procedures. There's full-fledged anesthesia, which is done by the anesthesiologist where the patients will lose their airway protective reflexes. And then in between, this is where we wish to be with procedural sedation, somewhere on that borderline between moderate and deep sedation. So the patients can open their eyes when their name is called or when they're painfully stimulated, and they usually have spontaneous circulation and cardiac function. Once in a while, it becomes temporarily inadequate, but generally we sedate people deeply enough for lack of memory of the procedure, but not so deeply that they quit breathing or develop cardiorespiratory instability. So we are looking to be on that border between moderate and deep. Moderate sedation sometimes is not sufficient for disagreeable procedures. If moderate sedation, patients will have appropriate response to verbal stimuli and they won't need an airway intervention, but they may not be sedated enough to enable the procedure. They still have their airway protective re reflexes and they still are spontaneously ventilating. Anesthesia is taking sedation too far. The patients are unresponsible even to pain. They lose their airway protective reflexes and have risks of aspiration. And they have sometimes inadequate circulatory or ventilatory stability. This isn't where we want to take patients. We want to take them to deep sedation or maybe at the very border of deep sedation where they may be a little hypotensive. They may, they, they're not going to be hypoxic and they have not lost fully their airway protective reflexes. That, those reflexes may be less than normal, but they're not lost. And generally the patients also are able to maintain spontaneous ventilation and they usually don't have cardiac stability compromised. Once in a while that happens and we react to that in a way I'll teach you about, but the people are spontaneously breathing and spontaneously having circulation when procedural sedation goes well. And we also, we like to watch the entitled CO2 tracing to make sure the person's spontaneously ventilating. Because remember, the person will show changes of their entitled CO2 well before they become hypoxic with pulse oximetry. Uh, skills needed, obviously, because the sedatives can blunt ventilatory drive. Once in a while, you need to support the ventilation, usually nothing more than a, a chin th thrust or jaw lift, but you have to still be good at intubating patients just in case it comes to that. And we like to monitor patients closely for their skin color, their respiratory rate, their oximetry. If they do get intubated, we have to make sure we have to, we've placed the tube properly. But remember, who's the best doctor in the hospital at getting an airway? It's the anesthesiologist or the emergency physician. So we need airway skills to do this procedure safely. We also want to get the patient um, ready with extra oxygen and we need to be able to support their oxygenation if necessary. So we have to be good at using a bag valve mask. We have to be good at placing nasal or, 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 oral, or oral airways on occasion. And again, the goal of sedation is moderate or right on that border between moderate and deep sedation. And remember, levels of sedation are a continuum, and we don't want to take the patient too far into deep sedation where they have lost airway protective reflexes to some degree. You may need to have the patient somewhat to the deep level, but you don't want to be very deep, and you definitely wish to avoid general anesthesia for your patients with sedation. We definitely also need to go beyond just simply decreasing anxiety. 
we want the patient not to remember. And as far as who does procedural sedation, I think in every country in the world, anesthesiologists oversee sedation at the hospital-wide level. But the anesthesiologists may not be available when we need them in the emergency department. And that's why we as emergency physicians have to be able to do this procedure safely and competently to take the patient to that edge between moderate and deep sedation. Um, anesthesiologists in most hospitals don't need to be present for minimal or moderate sedation, at least in the United States. And the procedure of procedural sedation is part of the core curriculum of the teaching of emergency medicine, knowledge, and skills in any residency program. I know in Poland, you have a shortage of anesthesiologists. And so for emergency physicians to be able to safely do procedural sedation is a good thing. And then the next question is who uses which sedatives? And in the States, we had a controversy. The anesthesiologists did not wish to let emergency physicians use propofol which is ironic because actually propofol is probably one of the safer drugs to be used when it's used appropriately. And I actually helped write a clinical policy for the American Academy of Emergency Medicine that um, articulated why propofol should be used by emergency physicians and that anesthesiologists should not stand in the way. So again, what do we do with procedural sedation? It's like the bright white light in the men in black. It won't let you remember. And I call it my bright white light because propofol itself is a white colored medication. It's the color of milk. Of course, propofol can have some downsides and we'll talk about that. But when we use right, propofol is amnestic for the patient. And when we use propofol or other sedatives such as ketamine, the first goal of course is to not harm the patient. But the other goals are mercy for the patient, amnesia of the procedure for the patient and control of a high degree of discomfort. Before starting on a procedural sedation and before giving drugs, we need to know about the patient. We need to know about their physical status. Do they have airway diseases such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Are they prone to airway obstruction and having things like obstructive sleep apnea? Do they have other chronic illnesses such as end-stage renal disease or heart failure? We look, at, we look into that before we ever start. We ask the patient if they had problems or difficulties or side effects with prior sedations or anesthesias. We ask about their medication allergies. We look at their American Society for Anesthesiology score. An ASA procedural sedation one score is a healthy patient. A two is a patient with mild well-controlled disease such as well-controlled asthma. A patient with level three is severe systemic disease such as poorly controlled diabetes or class three heart failure. A person who's class four has severe systemic disease that's a constant threat to life, such as New York Heart Association class four heart failure, such as severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease with chronic hypercarbia, such as end-stage cirrhosis. A level five is a patient not expected to survive a procedure and a level six is an organ donor. So we're not doing procedural sedations on anybody but ASA PS1 and two patients and maybe sometimes a class three patient. We also want to know the patient's airway very well. First, look in the mouth and collect the malampati score. Uh, malampati score one or two, those patients tend to be easy to innovate if necessary. Class three patients tend to be a little more difficult and class four more difficult still. Look in the patient's mouth. Look at the malampati score as you acquaint yourself with the patient's airway. When you look at the patient also, decide whether they will be difficult to ventilate if you have to use a bag valve mask. Do they have a beard that makes it difficult to mask seal? Are they obese? Do they have teeth? Do they have poor lung compliance? Things like that. We use the mnemonic moans to remember the patients who are difficult to ventilate by bag, by bag valve mask. Also look at the airway externally and see if they have good neck mobility. See if they have loose teeth. And importantly, look at the three, two, two rule. The mouth should open three finger breaths. There should be three finger breaths between the chin and the hyoid bone, and there should be about two finger breaths from the floor of the mouth to the thyroid cartilage. This, these patients tend to be easier to innovate if necessary. So we call it the lemon rule. Is the neck mobile? Is the mouth body score low? Do they, do they fulfill the 3-3-2 three, 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 rule? This is a very practical slide. Next, we will also see if the patient might be difficult to obtain a surgical airway if it came to that. So people with prior surgeries, with neck masses, people who've undergone radiation to the neck, they're going to have potentially complicated airways. And we wanna be aware of that situation before we start. We wanna be ready to do a cricothyroidotomy if you have to start a sedation on a patient who you can expect may very well have a difficult airway. 
I've never had to do a cricothyroidotomy on a patient I've sedated. I've never had to intubate a patient I've sedated, but good practice says to be ready. And I've done over 350 sedations and never had those compl complications. But again, you don't wanna be having that one time when you wish you were ready and you're not. Uh, it's a bit controversial whether the patient needs to have had an empty stomach for a number of hours before a procedure. It's not like an anesthesia where eight hours is probably the minimum. And because we don't seek to abolish airway reflexes, airway protective reflexes, my reading of the literature says the time since last ingestion doesn't really matter. Ideally, our hospital credentialing packet says that we should know the patient should have had an empty stomach for at least two hours. But again, the key for you is you're not abolishing the patient's airway protective reflexes and they don't have to have a long time without having had anything by mouth. Uh, because procedural sedation itself is a procedure, you need to get consent from the patient and the risk is basically blunting ventilatory drive, hypoventilation, hypoxia. So you not only getting a consent for the procedure for which you're sedating, you get a consent for the procedural sedation. And again, the benefits are mercy and amnesia for the patient. The risks are those related to hypoventilation and hypoxia. And I like to monitor my patients carefully, not only with continuous cardiac monitors and pulse oximetry and regularly checking their blood pressure, but also with capnography to monitor end tidal CO2. Because remember, a person can have a lack of hypoxia with hypoventilation for a number of minutes, but they will have a quick change in their end tidal CO2 if they're not breathing. So I like capnography to increase safety. And I like to prepare my patient who's gonna be spontaneously breathing with high flow oxygen. And you can actually get to almost 100% inspired O2 fraction if you give a patient oxygen both by nasal cannula and by a mask. So this is a way to pre-oxygenate patients for procedural sedation. And it's also a good way to pre-oxygenate patients before uh, rapid or delayed sequence intubation. I also like to have the emergency airway necessary available. So I put the laryngotracheal mask airway or LMA on the patient's abdomen. I don't, own, I don't open the package, but I know right where the airway is if I need it. I've never had to put one in during a sedation, but I wanna make sure I'm ready if I need to do it. And then the final pre-procedure preparations are basically have oxygen available, suction available, know where the bag valve mask is in case you need to use it. I've had one situation where I had to use bag valve mask to support ventilation. It was an elderly patient who had, um, who was 95 years old, and I gave them three tenths of the normal dose for procedural sedation, and yet they still became hypopnic and had to have ventilatory support. Um, other things, make sure that your nasal airways are available. That can sometimes get the tongue off the back of the throat. Uh, make sure the airway box is in the room and select a reasonable sedation agent. We'll talk about the ones I think are safe just, just next. Uh, we, if you wish to have reversal agents, you can. Naloxone is useful for reversing analgesics, such as opiate analgesics, if you use those with the sedation. Um, if you have a patient for whom you're worried about hypotension, you might want phenylephrine there, so you can give small doses to support blood pressure. But as far as the sedative agents themselves, uh, ketamine is a nice agent because it has an easy to remember dosing, it's relatively safe, and it is easy to follow to the endpoint. The dosing is on the order of one milligram per kilogram body weight, uh, subsequent doses, half of the first. And then the nice thing about ketamine is it has a little longer action than some agents and it is very dissociative. And you can see when the patient's ready because they will exhibit vertical nystagmus if you have them look upward. So when the patient has vertical nystagmus, you're there, the patient's ready. And you can have a procedure that lasts a fair amount of time with ketamine. So ketamine is also great to use for children who have to have sedation for wound repair. Um, it's not a ventilatory suppression as much as propofol. It's a bronchodilator. So if you ever have to do rapid sequence induction of, in, of intubation for an asthmatic patient, ketamine is the right sedative agent to use because it itself is a bronchodilator. It's unlike propofol does not work by GABA receptors. It can be combined with propofol. It can be, it's contraindicated for hypertension and tachycardic patients. And the other thing about ketamine that's a, a caution is if you administer it too quickly, it can be very dysphoric and very uncomfortable for the patient. Propofol is one that we've had controversy about in the United States. 
And the anesthesiologists in the United States wanted to keep it away from emergency physicians. And I don't know why, because there was a Canadian technical report that came out in 2008 that involved input from anesthesiologists, emergency physicians, nursing, et cetera. And they concluded in Canada that propofol was the safest procedural agent and the most cost effective, better than ketamine and better than uh, benzodiazepines such as midazolam. And in 2011, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services clarified some previous confusion and made a statement that said propofol is safe to use in emergency physicians' hands. The dose of propofol is 0.5 to 1 milligrams per kilogram over half a minute to a minute. Of course, lower dose for the elderly. And higher doses are often needed in patients who are alcohol or drug abusers who have livers that are accustomed to metabolizing medicines or drugs. Uh, it's easier to add any medication slowly rather than rapidly. So we give propofol slowly. And I will talk to the patient and ask them questions like, what was the name of your third grade teacher? Or what was the name of the high school you attended? And that way I can determine when the patient's sufficiently sedated that they will be amnestic. And again, propofol, I call it my bright white light because it doesn't let you remember. It has rapid onset and rapid recovery. It's also great to use when you're using, when you're doing a, a reduction of a fracture or dislocation because it can, must, it can be relaxing to the muscles, but it can be bad. Pop singer Michael Jackson died as a result of inappropriate propofol use outside the hospital without appropriate monitoring. And we, we don't want to ever do that to our patients. So I liken procedural sedation to the use of seatbelts and airbags in cars. Because if you have a seatbelt and an airbag, they're in your car, you hope never to have to use them. But um, if you need to protect yourself, you can. Uh, with propofol, the seat belts and airbags are the equivalent, uh, are, the, are manifested by cardiac monitors, oximetry monitoring, and tidal CO2 monitoring. So we give propofol, but we give it in a safe fashion. Procedural sedation agents are sort of like cars. An automobile can be the greatest servant to your productivity and your convenience and your comfort. Or an automobile can kill you if it's used incorrectly. But if you drive a car carefully, an automobile is likely to be useful to you and not fatal to you. And so it is with procedural sedation agents. If you use them carefully, they can be useful. If you use them carelessly, they can be fatal. Ketamine can be combined with propofol at a dose of 0.3 to 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of each. And the propofol lets you administer ketamine faster and the ketamine permits a longer uh, sedation. Uh, sometimes people thought, talk, like to talk about Atomidate, 0.1 milligram per kilo. We use Atomidate commonly to sedate the patient for rapid sequence innovation, but we don't use it for procedural sedations very often. Um, it, is a, it is not a negative inotrope like propofol, and it tends not to have emergency reactions like ketamine. So it does have potential use, but myoclonus happens in about 10 or 12% of people. So I, I talk about Atomidate just to be complete. But Aslam is an older sedative agent. Dose is 0.05 to 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, it hasn't killed somebody like Michael Jackson, but it is uh, it has a long half-life and it is more likely to cause respiratory depression than some of the newer agents like ketamine and propofol. I do not use midazolam at all for procedural sedation anymore. Um, you can consider adding an analgesic and that may make you able to use less dose of sedative, less, less dose of procedural sedation agent. And if you must give um, and analgesic, I think fentanyl is a good choice because it's the shortest half, it has the shortest half-life. But downsides of giving analgesics, analgesics also include that you potentiate ventilatory suppression and fentanyl can occasionally cause chest wall rigidity, although I've never seen that. Once you're ready, you've made all your preparations, it's time to call a timeout. And you go through what you plan to do, you ask the patient if they have any last minute questions, and I like to have members of the sedation team introduce themselves to the patient and state their role. And as they state their role in the sedation, every member of the team identifies to everybody else what is going to happen and what we can expect of all team members. Then we ask the patient if they have final questions, give them sedative, watch their end tidal CO2, watch their oximetry, watch their blood pressure, and sedate them carefully and safely so they can undergo whatever disagreeable procedure must be done. I like, again, as I'm giving sedation agents, I make small talk with the patient. I ask them questions they should be able to answer easily, like 
What was your mother's first name? What was your mother's middle name? What was your mother's last name before she got married? You know, things like that. And then I watched very carefully for the end tidal CO2 waveform, which as the person exhales, uh, uh, they um, tend to clear CO2 and then gradually the CO2 uh, accumulates again in the end tidal CO2. I mean, as far as quantifying how sedate they are, we have a numeric scale called the Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale, or RAS score. It's useful not only for sedation, it's also for communications with security if patients become obstreperous and, and disagreeable and need to be medicated and not respond to your verbal attempts to de-escalate their behavior. So our goal is to get the patient to a score of minus three. Moderate sedation, they eye, open their eyes to voice, and uh, but they're not unresponsive. We don't go to, we try not to go too far into four, we don't go to five. Then as they unsedate, they come back to zero. So I like to think of my procedural sedation tools, whether it's the things to make it safer, like in tidal CO2 monitoring and oximetry, or whether it's the drugs themselves. I think of them as tools on my tool belt, just like a master craftsman has tools on his tool belt. And I like to know how to use all of my tools, just like a craftsman knows how to use their tools. What's to do if problems occur? Well, the biggest problem with procedural sedation is hypoventilation or airway obstruction. So we can do jaw thrusts. We obviously would stop adding additional drug and do the jaw thrust suction if necessary. Nasal airway if you go to the point where jaw thrust alone is not sufficient and bag valve mask if you need to go beyond just the nasal airway. And again, in over 350 procedural stations, only once have I had to use a bag valve mask. And that was with a 95 year old who already was given a low dose but had an unexpected reaction to the propofol. If all else fails, you have to be ready to intubate. But again, in over 350 sedations, I've never had to intubate anybody. Once the sedation's done, the person should be awake enough to talk before you leave the room. And then we have our nurses monitor the patients for an additional hour. And we monitor them for things like hypoxia, evidence of aspiration, hypotension. Eventually, um, we make a final summary note about the sedation, and you should make a note about whether airway interventions or reversal medications had to be given. Again, the physician should stay until the patient's responding to verbal questions. And then at the time of discharge, you should note the patient's mental status, their vital signs, the fact that they can walk without stumbling, those sorts of things. So in summary, I like to keep, I suggest if you do procedural sedations, make a little index card or put it on your telephone, make it Make some memo somewhere where you can find the steps that you follow and follow the steps exactly and know where your airway adjuncts are, know your drugs, titrate the patient to light sedation by talking to them until they quit talking back. Use the Richmond analgesia and sedation scale to quantify their level of sedation. Monitor them appropriately once you're done. And basically a well-trained emergency physician can safely and effectively perform procedural sedation for patients. There was a nice summary written by Scott Weingart, who's a guru of this area, and I provide a link to that in my final slide. So if you wish to read more about procedural sedation, this is a really good resource in a place called EM Practice. So uh, in closing, I want to say some kubatsu. Thank you very much. I hope that I've taught you how to make your patients have a good trip, if you will, a good voyage into sleepy land while they're being sedated for a disagreeable procedure. And if you have questions, I'll, I'll obviously be here to answer them at the end. This is my email contact point, the email address you see. And I've listed also the web address for the MCRIT uh, discussion regarding procedural sedation, which I think you might find valuable. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Garigadis, for your lecture. So, dear participants, if you want to ask any questions, please write them down in the live chat. So, I'll check now whether there are any questions. Uh, we have a comment from Mr. Bogdan Tuziak. Thanks for the information about the USA situation. Yes, and uh, I think that we'll wait just a few seconds if any questions will appear. And I'll, I'll, while we're waiting, I'll make one comment, which is that um, 
when when emergency medicine techniques and emergency medicine in general becomes adopted yeah. in countries um, where it didn't originate, the country tends to go through the same controversies and questions and problems as we've gone through in countries that have had emergency medicine longer, like Great Britain, United States, Australia, Canada. Um, it, 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 sometimes the same issues play out, but they play out in a more rapid fashion. And so um, I would, if, you're, if you go into emergency medicine, I would be ready for some reluctance on the part of anesthesia to let the emergency physician use certain medications or perhaps even to do the procedure. But again, the key with procedural sedation is to be able to reverse the excessive sedation that might happen to cause a person to have blunted breathing drive. And anesthesiologists and emergency physicians both are very good at dealing with respiratory complications. So it's not that we need a reversal drug for these sedatives. We need to transiently be able to support ventilation in patients that might have become a bit more sedated than we intended. Yeah, uh, we have two questions uh, for you, Professor. So the first one, do you see the use of bispectral index monitoring to control the depth of sedation? That's a very good question. The question is whether we use by the best tool, uh, spectral index to monitor sedation. The answer is we don't. Um, the, it, it could be used, it would be logical to use, um, but we don't have that equipment readily available. And we find that if we talk to patients as we sedate them and make sure they can't answer our questions and then watch their end tidal CO2 level, um, that those are the keys toward enabling a procedural sedation that's, that's um, effective. One thing I really like about ketamine is when the person develops the, the vertical nystagmus that characterizes ketamine, which and, and vertical nystagmus means you have the nystagmus of a central cause rather than a peripheral, which is to say vestibular cause. Central nystagmus means the patient is sedated and they're ready to have the procedure. So vertical nystagmus is one reason, the achievement of vertical nystagmus with ketamine is one reason I like ketamine so well. I, I had a patient with an ankle injury, just like the one I saw when I worked last evening. And he developed vertical nystagmus and we were ready. He still was talking to us. He wasn't making any sense, but he was talking and he still had no recall of us reducing his really ugly ankle fracture dislocation. Okay, thank you very much. I have another one. How many procedural sedations are performed at your department per week, month, year? Um, I would have to guess on that number of how many we perform in our department. Um, our physicians work actually in three departments. Um, I know, that when we become recredentialed for procedural sedation every two years, if we have not performed 12 procedural sedations, we have to undergo ex extra training to be certified to do it again. Whereas if we have completed 12 or more in a two year period, then we are allowed to recertify simply by taking a written exam. So there are roughly 50 doctors in our group and 50 times 12 is 600 divided by two years is 300. So the answer is on the average, probably two or three times a day. It's not like it's every patient, but it's not unknown. And our nurses, because they see us do it a lot, they're also very um, good at helping us to carry out safe procedural sedations. Okay, thank you. So are there any more questions? I hope my talk I has been very practical yes. and it gives you it gives you a tool to use once you stop being a student and you become a resident and then you become a regular physician. Yes. Okay, so I suppose that there are no more questions. So thank you again, Professor Gary Gaddis. It was a great pleasure to have you at our keynote lecture uh, during the 57th uh, Polish edition of Juventus Promedicina Conference. Thank you once again very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Have a great day. You too. Okay, so dear participants, it was the last lecture for today. Remember about our competition and share a photo showing how you have participated in our conference. 
the prizes are waiting for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you very much for your participation in today's keynote lectures. Now, it's high time to announce the results. You can find them on our Facebook page. They will be published in a few minutes. Congratulations to all the winners and see you next year. Follow our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram and stay tuned. Thank you very much once again. And see you next year.